everyone uh, to this meeting of the Dunedin City Council uh, for Tuesday the 10th of December. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Morris uh, Turketo from the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints to open our meeting with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we humbly bow our heads before thee, the commencement of this council meeting, we thank thee for the opportunity to gather uh, here as a council and a public body uh, in this forum on this day. Uh, we thank thee for uh, this beautiful country that we have to live in in New Zealand. Uh, for the democratic processes that we have to live under. We're grateful for our, our city of Dunedin and for the wonderful freedoms that we have, the opportunity to express our own voice, uh, the opportunity to uh, practice our, our many beliefs and faiths as we come together this afternoon to uh, discuss important matters on the agenda and the under the presiding authority of his worship, the Mayor Hawkins. We invite thy uh, guiding hand and thy uh, spirit to uh, bless each and every one of us who have an input and who have feedback uh, that the council might take into uh, account uh, the voices and the will of the people uh, for all of those who they represent, uh, especially uh, uh, those of um, various communities of different values and different beliefs, might all be uh, taken into making decisions that would be beneficial and effective uh, for all of the people of Dunedin in making this continuing to make this a wonderful and a beautiful place to live. Uh, we ask you to please uh, bless the uh, council members that they'll be able to uh, deliberate and uh, be united in their decisions uh, that will be uh, beneficial to our great city. We ask the at this time, uh, Father, to uh, continue to bless uh, all of those in need that the needs of the people may be uh, addressed and be able to help uh, each and every one of them is our uh, humble prayer as we ask for thy blessings to open up this council meeting. We do so in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome colleagues. Uh, staff, members of the public and uh, the media. Um, as you may have noticed, we have a reasonably substantial agenda ahead of us today. Uh, just um, forewarning, I suppose, um, I intend to take a, a brief adjournment at uh, three o'clock or as near to as possible um, to, uh, to allow for um, refreshment stops as required. Item three, apologies. Uh, I'll move that the council accept the apology from Councillor Wiley, seconded Councillor Gary. All those in favour? Aye. Oh, sorry, and, and an apology from Councillor, Law, Councillor Hall for lateness. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Confirmation of the agenda. Uh, I'll move that Council uh, confirms the agenda with the following uh, addition and alteration. The alteration being the removal of item C3. Uh, the uh, and in regard to Standing Order 2.1, Option C be adopted in relation to moving and seconding and speaking to amendments. Seconded, uh, Councillor Lord. Any discussion? All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Uh, declarations of interest. Any amendments to be made to the interest register? Being none, I'll move that Council uh, notes uh, the elected member's interest reg register as attached confirms the proposed management plan for elected member's interests and notes the executive leadership team's interest register uh, as attached. Seconded, Councillor Gary. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? Uh, that's agreed. Confirmation of minutes. Uh, I'll move that 
Council confirm the public part of the minutes of the Ordinary Council meeting held on uh, the 25th of October, noting that, uh, as has been circulated, uh, the um, items 11 and 14 have been amended, the, the voting records of those. So with that amendment uh, to the minutes, second Councillor Elder, uh, all those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. Uh, 6.2, I'll move uh, that Council confirm the public part of the minutes of the Ordinary Council meeting held on the 30th of October 2019 as a correct record. Seconded, Councillor Staines. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. And finally, that uh, Council confirm the public part of the minutes of the Ordinary Council meeting held on the 12th of November 2019. Seconded, uh, Councillor Staines. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Uh, seven minutes of the community boards. Otago Peninsula Community Board, Councillor Gary. Your Worship, I would like to move that the Council notes the minutes of the Otago Peninsula Community Board meeting held on the 31st of October 2019. Seconded, Councillor O'Malley. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. Strathtyre Community Board, Councillor Lord. I would like to uh, move that we note the Strathtyre Community Board minutes of the 31st of October 2019. Seconded, Councillor O'Malley. Thank you. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Mosque Tyree Community Board, 7th of November. Councillor Houlihan. Yes. I'd like to move that. The minutes of the Mosque Tyree Community Board meeting held on the 7th of November. Seconded by Councillor O'Malley. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Saddle Hill Community Board, Councillor Raddick. Yes, I'd like to move that the Council accepts the minutes of the Saddle Hill Community Board held on the 5th of October 2017. Seconded, Councillor O'Malley. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Waikawaiti Coast Community Board, Councillor O'Malley. I'd like to move that the Council notes the minutes of the Waikawaiti Coast Community Board uh, meeting held on the 7th of November 2019. Seconded, Councillor Elder. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. And finally, the West Harbour Community Board minutes from the 7th of November. Councillor Walker. Yes, I'd like to move that the Council notes the minutes of the West Harbour Community Board a meeting held on 7th of November 2019. Seconded, Councillor Barker. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. Thank you. Uh, reports. Item 13, approval to grant electricity easement to Aurora Energy uh, Park, Mosgill Memorial Park. Mr West, Mr Graham. Any initial comments from either of you? I'll take the report as read. Questions, councillors? Councillor O'Malley. Just confirming that this easement's not going to get in the way of placing the Mosgill pool. Uh, no, it won't. Good. <laughs> Councillor Lords indicated a willingness to move. Any further questions? Seconded, Councillor Staines. As per the order paper? It's been moved and seconded. Would you like to speak to it? Any discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 14, approval to grant two drainage easements over part Fraser's Creek Local Purpose, open parentheses, Esplanade, close parentheses, reserve. Anything on this one? Questions? Moved. Moved, Councillor Staines. Seconded, Councillor Lord. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor Staines? Any discussion? In that case, I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 15. Thank you. Effortless. <laughs> Mr. Drew, Ms. Sargent. Mr. Sargent. Is sitting down. That's how that sentence ends. Uh, item 15, proposal to, re uh, to rename Desert Road to Moipuku Road. Any comments? Questions? Councillor Gary. Um, Mr Gr Drew or Ms Sargent, thank you for the really comprehensive report, but I had a question around the date of um, Mr Allison's letter. It appears to be dated the 18th of May 2018, and I was well, perhaps I've missed something, but I was just wondering why it had taken so long to come before us for a decision. 
Mm -hmm. uh, through your worship, um, there, there is a bit of a process in terms of um, considering um, road naming requests. It has taken longer than it, um, than it um, potentially should have. There was um, some delays with a uh, new council coming on board and um, scheduling of meetings. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Move Councillor Walker. Is there a seconder? Seconded Councillor Lofiso. No further questions, just checking. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Any discussion? Councillor Gary. Well, I was really pleased to see this come before us uh, because it is confusing. Um, but it's also confusing because local people call the new Harrington Point Road uh, Desert Road. That's what it's referred to. So I guess this will focus it, but the Desert Road uh, title will still be used locally for the new Harrington Point Road. Do you have any comment? No, we've already been there. Um, so that would be my comment, but I think it's wonderful to have a traditional name uh, raised uh, and the opportunity to use it. And uh, I think it shows a great deal of respect uh, for our local community. Further speakers? Councillor Raldo. I do support what Chris Gary says in, in the sense of understanding um, our heritage um, and the Māori tradition and traditional names is, is really important as part of our story and, and this recognises it, which is great. Councillor Walker, would you like to exercise your right of reply? No? And being that said, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Part one of our road naming omnibus, item 16, naming of a new road off Holyhead Street in Utram. Taken as read, I'm assuming. Uh, questions, Councillor O'Malley. I love these events too. Um, <laughs> I am noting that um, we're gonna have two items further along um, where um, it's going to be Neil Collins Drive, I think, it is, Lane, and and one of the reasons that we are considering Frank's Place is that Frank's Ferguson Place is considered too long, but Neil Collins Lane is not. Should the developers drive along, make a longer road? Is that the answer here? <laughs> <laughs> Can you explain why one is acceptable and the other one is not? Um, so, so the character number of characters in Neil Collins is slightly less than, than Frank Ferguson, and um, the length of the road for um, for this road off Holyhead Street is shorter in length. And um, for mapping purposes, it's preferred that we use short names for short streets um, in terms of uh, on the maps trying to to write the full Frank Ferguson place um, is is quite long for a short. Street. And we didn't want Ferguson. Oh, because um, there's a Ferguson Street somewhere else. Yes, that's but there correct. are Collins. There is a Collins Street somewhere else, right? Yes, there is. Councillor Walker. Uh, possessive apostrophes aside, um, I'd like to move that we approve the naming of the new road off Hollyhead Street, Outram, with Balmoral Development in Belmont's Drummond as Frank's place. Is there a seconder? Seconder Councillor Raddock. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor Walker? Any discussion? Councillor O'Malley. Um, I'm just glad it's not called Frank's Wind. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. 17, naming of a new road off Dundee Road uh, Mosgiel. Questions? Oh. No. Questions, councillors? Move councillor Staines. Second of councillor Gary. Would you like to speak to a councillor? Any discussion? There being none, I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 18, naming of a private way off Caledonia Drive in Mosgiel. Questions? Moved Councillor Staines, seconded Councillor Houlihan. 
Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Yes, I would. Um, so can, I just wanted to mention that uh, this was one of the names approved for the list to recognise the Polish community, uh, and that was quite a long time coming. Sorry, we're, oh, sorry. we're on... Beg your pardon. I'm it may also ahead. be an acknowledgement of the Polish community, but... <laughs> I beg your pardon. I'm ahead of myself. Not in any way that I'm aware. <laughs> uh, I'm ahead of myself. I was... <laughs> Councillor Elder? I was just... Um, Can you turn your microphone on, please? Sorry. Um, just referring... I think I jumped the gun here, too. Um, in our um, road naming register, um, we've got um, reference to the Polish community. Um, but in our road naming register, we also have 41 men and 15 women, two Māori names and no Māori place names in reference to our naming um, policy. And I'm just wondering whether, in fact, but I think I've jumped the gun on that one, um, like Chris Gary. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a broad statement. We'll take it. Um, um, just in reference to that, um, I would like to see some... Um, comment around that. My, my understanding just on that is that uh, council staff are working with local Runaka to come up with things that are appropriate to the uh, to the district that can be included as part of that register. Further speakers? Thank you. On Neil Collins Lane. It being none, I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? Any abstentions? That's agreed. Uh, item 19, naming of a private way off 212 Gladstone Road, North Mosgiel. Councillor Gary. Sorry. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the question about the Polish names. So uh, when the Polish names were uh, added to the list, um, uh, that was some time ago. And so this is, I just wanted to check, this is the first time we've actually applied one of these names, is it not? Um, so through Your Worship, there have been other times when we have selected a name from the pre-approved road name register. Yes, but there were two added yes. that had Polish heritage. And my question is, was, is this the first time that one of them has been used? I believe it might be, but just wanted to check that with you. Yes, that's correct. Thank you very much. Um, can I just say something on this matter? So just an update is that we have had some communication with the developer around the proposed name for this right-of-way. Um, previously, um, we'd had limited contact, and they support the naming of this right-of-way as um, Pomerania, but they propose that um, the suffix is changed to Pomerania Way. So um, if, we, if we could amend our staff recommendation um, that it be named Pomerania Way. You're comfortable with it? Yes. OK, thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Lord, moving, your, moving the staff's revised recommendation. Okay. Seconded, Councillor Gary. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor Lord? Further speakers? I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 20, review of roading by law. Mr Drew and Ms Sargent? Anything, any comments? Thank you. Questions, councillors? Councillor Vanivis. On the top of page 107, it says that one of the overall objectives was to improve understanding of the respective responsibilities for road users uh, and the council. Could, could you, oh, it says responsibilities for road users and the council. Could you explain what is actually meant by that? It seems ambiguous to me. Through your worship, that's, that's in, in regard to um, articulating the responsibilities to, to care for the transport, transport network. So it's more about the asset than um, the use of the, the network. So it's caring for the infrastructure rather than anything else? Um, that, that's primarily um, in terms of what the roading bylaw is, is currently uh, doing for us. Okay, no, I can give you an example if you like. So, for example, the developer's subdividing and is tracking a whole lot of mud out onto the road. So, that the bylaw is a way of um, saying that that's not okay, you need to clean that up. 
Great. Is Thank that you. That makes it completely clear. I appreciate that. Um, while I'm speaking, I also would like to say um, a, a bouquet for a change. Um, that I'm very pleased to see in the options that one of the disadvantages is actually recorded as staff resources are required to undertake this work. Um, very pleased that staff resources are actually being recognised. This is not something that has always happened here. And delighted to see that you're giving a balanced set of options in this regard. Thank you. Excellent question. Councillor Hulahan. I think this question has already been asked, but I'll just clarify this. Um, if we approve this bylaw, this doesn't make it easier for pedestrianisation or taking away car parks, does it? Can I clarify that? Through Your Worship, this, this is not approving a bylaw at this stage. Um, this is just noting that we are reviewing a current uh, roading bylaw that is in place. OK, so the reviews, but what they're going to do is then come back to us to say for approval. So if we pass this and then that gets ready for approval, is that going to make any of those things easier? No, well, so council will, so, so we'll come back to council with a revised yes. bylaw. At that point, you'll have an opportunity to say yes or no. If you think um, that it is a facilitating pedestrianisation and you're opposed to that, that, that is your opportunity to debate that and uh, get it taken out or emphasise whatever you, is your choosing. But so your answer is that this wouldn't help that at all? I'm just trying to clarify. Not this particular paper. OK, thank you. Councillor Lord. I just had a question regarding the, uh, if this, or when we review this, will this have any uh, effects about lime scooters or electronic scooters, <coughs> those sorts of things? So it's only things like detritus on roads and footpaths. And Councillor Milling? No further questions. Would someone like to move the recommendations or otherwise? Councillor O'Malley, you're moving as per the order paper. Second of Councillor Gary. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Any discussion? I'll put it all those in favour. Aye. Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Thank you. Item 21, meeting schedule for 2020. Ms Graham, welcome home. Questions? Happy to move. Move Councillor Stain, seconded Councillor Elder. Any discussion? There being all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 22, a delegation for uh, the Dunedin Heritage Fund. Any comments from you, Ms Graham? Any questions? I'm so happy to move. <laughs> well, I've second the Councillor Benson Pope. Would you like to speak to it, Mr Chairman? Uh, no. Oh, well, actually, briefly. Um, the, the Heritage Fund has for a long time had a very small pot of money to distribute by way of almost just encouragement rather than anything substantial. And thanks to the uh, good work of the Heritage Fund, and I'm talking about prior to me being on it, um, there has been uh, an increase in the amount of funding that we have, and we now have an amount of funding where we're starting to actually make you know, some reasonable sort of grants uh, to promote a wider range of, pro of projects. And uh, the reason that I feel that we need to have this uh, delegation for the, uh, the Needham Heritage Fund um, is because we are now in, in the process of expanding what we do. Uh, it would be really good if uh, councillors took note of what the Heritage Fund actually is doing and hopefully uh, encourage more people to actually look at the Heritage Fund and see that we are now in a position to actually do a bit more that would, than what we were able to use, do in the past. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Gary. Yes, Your Worship, I just wanted to comment uh, when we were out on a field trip this morning. Uh, we were in an area where there are a large number of heritage buildings and uh, one of the things we heard about was the difference that the money from the Heritage Fund had made uh, to the preservation and restoration of those very important buildings in a key part of our city. Uh, so I just wanted to note that in passing as being extremely important. Thank you. 
Councillor Vandiver, is your right of reply? Um, thank you. I'll put it, all those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Thank you. Item 23, financial result for the period ended 31 October 2019. Coming to this meeting due to the um, meeting schedule, ordinarily would come to the Finance and Council Control Organisations Committee meeting. It's been elevated momentarily. I welcome Mr Toombs, Mr Logie. Any opening remarks from either of you two gentlemen? Actually, yes. Thank you. Um, afternoon all. Um, you've all got the papers there. Uh, there's about 10 pages or so of lots of numbers in various levels of detail and various narrative explanations for variances. I'll just make a couple of observations, if I may. Um, what these reports really do is they focus on the, uh, the quantum of income and expenditure, comparing to budget, 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 budget and where it's being spent. Um, you have to drill down into the narrative to get a more detailed understanding of some of the variances. But if I, I might just point out a couple of things. On page 124, the, um, the executive summary shows in the second column from the right lots of Fs, they're favourable variances. Now, we don't get too carried away this time of year because everything's favourable. We've got to understand that organisations such as ours, there's always timing differences in the way income and expenditure budgets are loaded and what actually happens um, in reality. So there's that snapshot, and it is, it is better to see Fs than Us, put it that way. Um, on page 129, we try to, for those who are, aren't so number, numbers focused, display the same numbers in, in graphs. And I'll just quickly speak about each of them four, if I may. Um, the first one here today, an operating surplus. You can see the red lines above the green line, and that's good. Now, there are timing differences, so that they, might, they may change, but all we're doing here is trying to get a level, level of comfort. So we get a nice level of comfort over the operating surplus. It's important that all four of these are good. If three of these are good and the other one's not, that might indicate there's something needs further investigation. So you can't just look at one aspect and say, great, everything's, everything's cool. So operating surplus gets a tick. Uh, year to date operating cash flow, the one to the side of it, you'll see the red line is actually beneath the green and the, and the budget line. The reason for that is because we were budgeting for a chunk of money to come in in July, and we actually got it in June. So it's in last financial year's results. So that, uh, overall, that, if that money would have been received in July, the red line would have been where we wanted it to be. So again, just, and, and this is explained in a narrative, but I just thought I'd uh, give a verbal update. Year to date capex, um, slightly beneath the green line. We expect that red line to stay between the two lines there. Um, there'll be some projects that are under and over budget, but that, generally speaking, is close enough to the green line to be quite comforting. <coughs> and then the interest revenue ratio on the right hand side, showing that the um, interest rates continue to decline over time. I, I won't go through all the pages, just wanted to point out the, the front page and then a gra graphical page for those that prefer graphs to numbers. Yeah. Thank you. Questions, Councillor Lord? Uh, sorry, Councillor, can you get a little closer to your thing? Yeah, sorry. Um, thinking about the capex being slightly below the budgeted line at this stage, but noting that on page 133, where you've given the capex by department, we see that transport is, um, and largely due to the Peninsula Road, I would assume, punching above its weight and almost uh, 4 million over. Are you, com well, and I, I ask you as in the finance person, but are we confident that we're still going to achieve our capex budgets for the year? And I realise it's early days, but... Uh, overall, we'll be close. There will be some overs, there will be some unders, there will be some projects that we we'll ask to slide into future years. The reason for the transport year-to-date overspend is the favourable uh, climatic conditions. They've been able to get on and do an awful lot more than they would have been able to do if it was wet. Councillor Vanderbis. I'm delighted to see the uh, much lower interest rates uh, helping us and uh, should hopefully continue to help us for a while, especially since the debt keeps going up. Um, I did put the question to you this morning, and I'd hope to have an answer by now, uh, regarding what the effect would be uh, across the DCC group 
If we had, for instance, a reversal of the recent fortunes with uh, interest rates dropping uh, by at least 2%, uh, what would happen if those interest rates went uh, up 2%? What would it cost the DCC group extra? Okay, apologies for not getting back to, you, to your question this, this, late this morning. I've just been um, working with our Treasury guys to try and work out some of the intricacies of the uh, calculation. So it's important, um, I guess I'll make a few observations here if I can, a few comments. Please. We have a um, Treasury risk management policy and one of the main purposes of that is to protect us against things like interest rate rises. So if, interest, if we got a debt of say 200 million and interest rates overnight go up 2%, that doesn't all flow through to us. Our debt is in chunks of debt, which is fixed for the medium term, short term, long term. So our Treasury risk management policy gives us a lot of protection against this. Um, interest rates, actually, interestingly, today you may or may not be aware, uh, um, ANZ today released their projections for the next 12 months interest rates. The official cash rate is 1%, and they're expecting that to drop to 0.9 in the next 12 months. So I'm not answering your question, but it's given some context that. They're expected to go down before they go up, but sooner or later they will go up. Where our exposure is debt we take out once the interest rate goes up and debt we have to refinance. A lot of the debt we're refinancing at the moment, we're refinancing at cheaper rates than we're currently paying because it's old debt. Uh, for example, we, we, we're fixing debt at the moment at just around 2%. But to answer your question, Councillor, if for every, 100, for every 100 million we have to take out a new debt in a calendar year, assuming it's spread out throughout the year, so it's not all on the 1st of July. For every 100 million we take out, if interest rates go up by 2%, that's about a million dollar extra interest. Okay. So a million dollars times 10, whatever. If group debt was, if we had to take out $10 million new debt, so that where we're going to pay more interest would be on refinancing and in new debt. And very ballpark figures next financial year, both of them are expected to be around a million, a hundred million. A hundred million new debt and a hundred million, yeah, hundred million refinanced debt. So if we assume that they're both taken out evenly through the year, there's an extra one million on one, extra one million on the other, an extra two million uh, interest cost. Is it still assumed that we're going to be taking out an extra hundred million dollars worth of debt for every year for the next three years? Oh, for these purposes, I was just using one financial year just to, just to give an answer to your question. That if, um, if we take out a hundred million new debt and interest rates go up by two percent, that will have an extra interest cost of a million. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, my question's partially been answered, but I just wanted to go back uh, for a little bit more detail. Um, and so I noted on page 138 around transport grants and subsidy revenue favourable 1.794 million, primarily due to the high level of capital project delivery. Uh, and then the statement around the uh, transport capital expenditure um, being overspent, and it would be very easy to look at that and, and be alarmed. Um, and then it goes on to talk about the Peninsula Connection. I just wanted to get clarity, and perhaps it's through you to uh, Mr Drew, it might be he that needs to answer this, but the project appears to be being delivered uh, in super quick time. It, it seems to be delivered, and obviously being within budget's important too, but uh, the delivery of it seems to be a very timely matter, and I'm looking now at page 140, um, and I just wanted to get clarity as to is that the case? Well, I can answer that, Councillor. So currently the peninsula at the end of October was sitting at $6.8 million versus a budget of 6.2 for the year to date. The four year budget's around $22 million. So there's still quite a bit of room before we get to the end of that project. Councillor Walker. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. It uh, refers back to your very user friendly graphs on page 129. And forgive me if it's, uh, if it's a dumb question. Um, in the interest revenue ratio graph, who and why is the benchmark set at eight percent? Who, who sets that and who decides? Right. That's something we're looking at right as we speak. Actually, oh, sorry, that, that's the, that is something we're looking at as we speak. That's been a benchmark that we've used in council reporting for <coughs> years rather than months, and we've actually kicked off this morning a, a review to see let's get something more current and more relevant for that. So it, it's. It's, it's something that's a hangover from earlier days that we're, we're looking at amending and updating. 
Councillor Lord. Yeah, look, I had a question just to follow on from Councillor Vandervis's question. So you said if we borrowed $100 million this year, we would take on an additional $1 million worth of debt? No, no, no sorry. The question was interest. if interest rates were to jump by 2%, 2%. what would the cost of that jump be? Yeah, yeah but, but what my question is, the, follow the other side of that is, so you, you gave the example if we had a $1 million, $100 million of new borrowing and $100 million of refinancing, what would be the saving on today's rates of that $100 million of the, the, re uh, the refinancing? What would that be coming down from? That's one of the questions I'm just waiting on an answer for so I can, I can give. Uh, I've asked the question, I'm just trying to get them details. I, I was only given the question a couple of hours ago, so still working out some of these numbers. Okay, okay. But uh, again, if I just continue in this theme, got to understand that taking out debt now will have long term benefit because if interest rates do rise, taking it out now will lock us into a cheaper rate. I, I read an article the other day in the um, Auckland Herald about the Labour Party having a big borrowing campaign because they argued that it was never a better time to borrow and I just wondered is, is that something that we should even consider ourselves as a municipal authority, a better time to do work now than um, like the government, the, take advantage of those low rates? Well, I think you're referring to the Grant Robertson quotes, like we have lowest borrowing cost in New Zealand history so now is the time to invest. It makes sense to take advantage of the low debt. As you saw from the annual plan, we have brought forward a lot of renewals programs because we've got the capacity to deliver and it's the cheapest time to, to deliver these things if, if they're debt funded. Councillor Barker. On um, page 138, talking about the waste and environmental revenue uh, was an unfavourable 1.2 million, primarily due to lower volumes through the Green Island landfill, which is wonderful news. However, is it a trend or a timing issue? And how does that affect the finances? Oh, okay. That's, uh, can I answer the second part first? How's that? Absolutely. Okay, so it's going to have a short-term negative impact on our income, but it might be long. There's expected to be longer-term operational benefits. So it's kind of these two-edged sword, if that's the right phrase. Um, <laughs> is it a trend, or is it? Uh, there's a lot of unknowns that will d dictate whether. Uh, this is a permanent thing or whether it will reverse in three or four months' time. We don't control them, ver them variables, unfortunately. Um, but we're, we're conscious of this trend when we're setting next year's budget. We're not ignoring the fact that the, the activity will be down, so revenue will be down. Councillor Elder. Just a question, and maybe it would be better if um, property were able to um, make comment on this, but underspend was due to delay of some pro timing of some projects, including the South Dunedin Community Health Complex, School Street Housing Upgrade and the Central Library Refurbishment pro Project. And I was just wondering um, if there was any comment on how that's progressing and, uh, and budget accordingly. Probably just fair to say that sometimes, the, again, uh, as Mr. Toome said before, sometimes the phasing can be a little bit out and can be a little bit, a little bit optimistic in terms of the delivery of those projects. Invariably, as you get into a project, particularly, I think the School Street housing development needs a little bit of remedial work before they can continue to do the, 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 the build. So sometimes the demolition can take a little bit longer. So a, a lot of it just seems to be timing. Okay, thank you. Good questions. Someone like to move the report. Councillor Lord, seconded Councillor O'Malley. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Well, not really. Reinforce what Mr. Toome said. It happened, it's early days in the year, so we can't know exactly where we're going, but um, the, the trends are all looking quite good at this stage. So, yeah, happy. Hope everyone can support it. Further speakers? There being none, I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 24, and we'll take this item and then uh, take an adjournment subsequent to this, Dunedin City Holdings Limited Share Capital. Uh, Mr Toombs, any opening comments from you? Uh, I may. Yeah, just, um, just a bit of an overview, just, just to um, emphasise four key points that I'm hoping were made in the council paper. Uh, this paper is really just a follow-on from the June approval of the DCHL statement of intent uh, this 
financial year. I think I mentioned that in sections five and sections 11 of my paper. Um, so the statement of intent increased debt and that level of debt cannot be accessed under the existing arrangements. So need to either introduce new arrangements or amend the existing arrangements. So this paper is really about how to enable a previous decision, not about changing anything. So just to emphasize that. Questions? Councillor Lord? Happy to move, that's fine. Councillor Vanderbus. In today's newspaper, you say, Mr. Toome, that um, this uh, increase will simply enable the future debt to be available and provide some liquidity headroom. That headroom could be useful if needed, for example, if a natural disaster struck the city. <coughs> I was on council when our combined group debt was only in the region of five to six hundred million. And at that point, it was argued that we needed to raise the uh, headroom to uh, 850 billion. Uh, and exactly the same uh, quote was made then. This is before your time. In fact, almost the identical words where we needed to raise this extra $250 million of potential debt in order um, to have some headroom available, some liquidity headroom, and that that headroom could be, usefully, could be useful if needed, for example, if a natural disaster struck the city. We are now in a situation where I'm having a deja vu experience. The deja vu being that back then I said, if there you a question your, coming, Councillor? Yes, there is. If you give yourself an extra $250 million worth of headroom, which we did back then, and claim that it's going to be available in the case of a natural disaster, and we didn't have a natural disaster other than perhaps Aurora, which wasn't certainly not a natural one, and that that debt has basically already been gobbled up, and we are now in a situation where this new liquidity headroom that you're talking about that you claim might be available if a disaster struck. Is it not true that in fact we have to raise this money now because the disaster has already struck and it's aurora and we are committed over the next three years to raising our debt by $100 million every year simply to keep aurora in the game? I think if I can, if I've understood your question correctly, it's is the headroom just a bit of a buffer that can be used at discretion? Um, I thought that was addressed in this item C of the recommendation that the debt is capped at the statement of intent level unless this council explicitly says to DCHL we can increase it. So it doesn't become a usable fund unless it's explicitly agreed by this council. Okay, and that's exactly the same as it was the last time we raised the debt by $250 million. But I put it to you that I put this graph about, a graph that the DCC refused to print and a graph that the ODT refused to print uh, very much earlier in this year. And I said that what this graph says is that we are committed in terms of group debt to a billion dollar debt. Ex-Mayor Cull claimed that no, in fact we only had $200 million worth of debt because he didn't want to look at the whole picture. What this graph says, and the graph is taken from council uh, papers, is that this new debt facility isn't one that is going to be available for natural disasters. That in fact we are already committed to spending this money and that we in fact have no choice but to keep pushing the debt massively up by near $100 million for every year in the coming three years. Is that the case or is it not? Yeah, the statement of intent from DCHL I think clearly shows the group's spending intentions and therefore resulting debt um, profiles. So yes, we do have to raise our debt capacity to a billion dollars and most of that won't be available for any natural disaster that's to strike. It's because we are committed to keep on throwing good money after bad at Aurora. Not so much a question, but I do understand the Chief Executive has a response. 
Yeah, it's just um, it's worth noting there's there's two separate pieces here. So um, at at present we are raising the debt ceiling uh, in order to be able to raise the debt for the things that are being publicised that we will be doing t till today, and and that debt limit is pointed out in the paper is effectively within the inflation adjusted 850 million we've had in the past. We won't be able to go above 927 without explicit approval. I don't think we did have that in last time, but we added it in specifically because of this kind of expectation from Council this time. Uh, over the coming few months and year, we will be having to have a discussion with you about what you want to do about the predicted levels of spend, particularly in Aurora. You're right. And there are options on the table which you guys are going to have to discuss, which, you, which this Council will have to make some decisions. We put up an annual plan time, uh, a long-term plan time, a proposal potentially to sell down some investment property. There was some nervousness about doing that without a full assessment of the wider variety of options. So we will be coming back to you for some decision making and simply raising debt isn't the only option you have on the table. You'll be able to make decisions and we'll be taking you through a decision making process to say, is this the right suite of companies that you want to own? Are you still happy owning them? Are you still happy owning a Waipori fund? Are you still happy owning a $100 million investment property portfolio? Are you still, so there is all of those options. As you're well aware, the bunch of companies themselves are worth comfortably over the total level of debt predicted and are able to be sold in order to pay that debt off. You can raise your eyebrows, but that is the facts from the actuaries who do that kind of assessment. And with, with, uh, with all of those options on the books, you'll then make a decision about whether you want to raise debt further or whether you want to sell some assets in order to keep the debt under, that, uh, under that, the level that's in this paper. So th that next step is the next step in the process that's not subject to this paper. Is it true that simply selling these spare properties that we have, uh, even if we were able to get them sale ready, is still not going to be enough to keep us within the existing debt limits profile in what is proposed for the spending over the next three years? Even if we were able to get them sale ready, that, that works underway, so that all properties can be made sale ready. It just depends on what you want to get for them. You, we could sell them tomorrow if you like, but if you if you do certain things in advance, you get a better return. Um, estimate investment property portfolio is about $100 million worth. So, but, but that, that property portfolio also has an income. So you need a thorough look at what your options are for both the income and the cost of getting them sale ready. And that's what the piece of work over the next while will take you all through. Over this term of council, that's what the, the next piece of work will take you through. What are the pros and what are the cons of all of the investments that this council owns? What do they bring in? What's their return? Is it better than what you would get if you paid down debt, for example? Thank you. Uh, the question was, however, is it true that if we simply sell the property portfolio and you say we might get 100 million for it, we might even get 150, is it true that we would still have to seek an increase in the debt facility to manage the projected spending over the next three years? So are you asking if we took one item of our one, one and a half billion dollars of assets and sold just a hundred yes. million dollars worth. No, that yes. wouldn't be enough because Thank as you, you can see in here, Thank as you, you talked about yourself, there's a, the, we're expecting to come back to you with, with a bigger increase than this. So there'll be a whole suite of things you'll have to consider. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you, Mr. Toombs. I just wanted to talk about the benefits of having access to money at a time prior to large developments like the hospital rebuild and what that means for our city. That'll have too much impact on the hospital's plans. Uh, the money we'll have will be um, used for us in emergency situations as opposed to just spare cash. You talk about the, talk about the headroom. You were talking about um, in another uh, previously. You were saying that it's a benefit if we've got access to some money because what will happen when we've got infrastructure work that needs to be done now? If we can do it sooner before the um, hospital rebuild, we can save the city a lot of money. Is that correct? So, sort of the same. It was more the, um, Tombs, can you use your microphone? Oh, sorry. The cost of that now being so low means that the more borrowings 
if we borrow money now, we can get the work done sooner at a better rate than it would be in, say, five years' time. OK, thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Are we looking, you know, we, I think sometimes we hear this number and we think that that means the city itself is, is taking out that much debt. Is it true to say that really the group is effectively using all its pooled assets to act as a guarantor to then enable companies, CCOs, to access better rates of interest and better terms for their, for their debt than potentially Aurora, as it seems to be the favourite company to talk about, could potentially go outside the Treasury and gain money itself anyway if it wanted to because it's a CCO, but it probably wouldn't necessarily get it at the same favourable rate. Is that correct? Yeah, there's a couple of things there. One, the um, Aurora, for example, are part of the debenture agreement which the, all of the group borrow under, so there would be some pretty tight legal legalities we've been looking at, but notwithstanding the existing debenture, if any CCO was to go straight to the market, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have the same S&P rate, standard and pause rating we've got. They wouldn't have the same reputation in the market. They wouldn't have the same buying power. Th they would definitely have to borrow at higher rates than they get through going through the existing structure. So we're using the structure to obtain favourable terms. Um, and then the other one being that effectively, if Aurora is stable internally of itself with its own debt ratio and, and you know, it effectively is supplying a monopoly to a, a group of people that are not necessarily going to cut the power off pretty soon, I doubt that Aurora is in any particular threat. So is this debt level, does it really represent a threat to the city or is it just simply reflecting the fact that Aurora has a massive maintenance program to establish right now? Uh, well, I can answer that very, very simply at a council level. Um, talking, people often quote about debt ratios and one of the most commonly thrown around one is the debt equity ratio. Um, and you can't really compare council's debt equity ratio with the private sector. Totally, totally different beasts. Uh, you can't really compare the group debt equity, equity ratio with any other group because there's just big differences between us. But it is quite useful to compare council's debt equity ratio with other, de other councils of a similar size debt, debt equity ratio. And that analysis is quite easy. So just, I've got some figures here actually, just based on the June financial statements that were all audited. I don't know if you all know what debt equity is, it's basically how much asset cover you've got for your debt. Um, two councils, their debt equity ratio is over 20%. One council is around, in the range of around 13 to 15%. And about eight or nine, count, uh, six or seven councils are between the seven and 10%, seven and 12% seven and range, eight to 12% range. So you can see, this is, we, we were 7% at the end of June. And over the long term plan, the seven's going to get higher because we're borrowing more to do more. So our seven will go up, but it will keep us in the eight to 12% bracket. It's not going to make us an outlier by any stretch. Okay. Councillor Reddick. Yes. Um, just for clarification, the headroom that you've, we've talked about today, is that 48 million? A difference between 975 and 927, so yeah. Great. yeah. Great. And just to get that clear, what it yeah. and, and, and there's no science behind that figure. It could have been five million lower. Yeah, it's, just, uh... yeah, it's fine, uh, about five percent. So I just wanted to get that clear. The other thing is uh, the Aurora debt of 175 million. The increase in Aurora debt, of course, is going to be uh, spent on the, the pole renewals and all of, uh, removing safety risk. Plus, it will give us return on investment over time and we will in fact get all that money back uh, within Aurora and uh, to maintain a 5% return on investment over time, is that correct? Uh, I can't guarantee that, but that, that's certainly without the spend we won't get, yeah. yeah. In, in rough terms, so yeah, based yeah. on the two workshops that we've attended, yeah, yeah. Uh, that certainly looks to be the case and seems, uh, you know, to me, a perfectly comfortable investment. However, the 65 million that you want to, uh, that we're looking to increase the DCC debt by, uh, that's going into, well, it looks like it's going into the George Street and the improvements in uh, the university area from where I'm sitting, so 30 million on George Street uh, to turn it into a single um, one-way street, and then into 20 million around the university area. So it's about you know 50 to 60 million there, and so uh, that uh, though there will be no return on those investments, so they are things that we could in fact do without. And, in the long term plan, all this is doing is just bringing them forward. 
So it's not Sorry. introducing any new projects at a council level, it's just bringing stuff forward while it's cheaper to do it. Yes, but if we decided not to do those things... We oh, could that, that's the next long-term plan council could have that chat, I guess. Right. Thank you. Councillor Elder. Just looking at um, comments around sale of capital assets and also Waipori Fund, um, with the capital assets, one, we gain income, and two, we gain capital gain. Um, so would you say that that benefit from both of those would be worth keeping as compared to the low interest rates right now? In comparison, I think we just need to wait. That, that's the piece of work we've got to bring back to you. So it's best if we don't just say that off the hoof. S some things really return and some things don't. So it is better we bring that back to you rather than just make a kind of off the cuff summary. That's the piece of work we want to go through with you over the next wee while. So we will. But it'll be a mix. So we will be reviewing the returns on each. Yes, so indeed. You will, be, you will get all that information. A yeah. good decision. The, the other um, point is the Waipuri Fund appears to be re returning 9%, which is far higher than the borrowing rate. Um, and so, therefore, I suppose we could consider borrowing to be a gain um, at a lower interest rate to be a gain rather than a loss when it comes to the Waipuri Fund. Yeah, and the 9% was last financial year's actual return. And, and if, if you have an investment fund that's returning you greater than the cost of borrowing, um, you keep, keep the investment fund down. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Hall. Since we set the um, borrowing at 850 million back in 2011, um, our costs have gone up dramatically on traffic management, health and safety, and the living wage. And that is making a, a big um, draw on our um, spending. So this is something that I see has to go up. And um, I would say in the next five years, the way health and safety is going, it may even have to go up a little. Thank you. We'll get into debate soon. Um, but are there any further questions of the report? Councillor Lord? Well, it was just really a point of clarification, and it was to do with the uh, the reason we've the group on on mass has moved from from a debt of around 650 million, which has sort of been a bit constant for the last three or four years, uh, slumped down and up, um, to moving up to as as Councillor Vandevis says, in the next few years it will get closer to the billion dollars. But I just wanted to clarify that this is not just about Aurora. This is also the fact that we have made a significant investment in a, a long-term capex plan of in the vicinity of $860 million. So this debt is not just a raw debt, this is also DCC debt. Is that correct? Yeah. Thank you. Once again. Councillor Vanivis. Under option two on page 148, it says that Council either identifies a mix of alternative strategies to enable DCC and Aurora to continue their planned capital expenditure programs within existing borrowing arrangements or amends the planned capital expenditure programs. Is it not true that Aurora, the main player in all this, is committed to the planned capital expenditure programs, has already been fined $5 million for not actually having the network up to scratch and simply has to spend this money. And in fact, there is no alternative arrangements for Aurora's spend if we continue to hold on to it. Just a point of clarification, Councillor. I'm assuming you're referring to the Commerce Commission's High Court prosecution. I'm, I'm unaware that a decision has been reached in that if, if you are that's where the $5 million figure comes from. The $5 million has already been budgeted, Your Worship, by Aurora in anticipation. A separate thing. Thank you. Yeah, look, option two was put in there because we don't like to say there are no other options. Um, it's a theoretical more than a practical possibility. And I think the bullet points under disadvantages make the point that Aurora cannot really do a U-turn on that. So we are absolutely locked in. We do have to spend this money. Richard Healy's predictions of a billion dollars and mine earlier this year have come true. We told you so. Pre-election, 
We are now getting it confirmed post-election. You agree that we are essentially committed to taking the DCC debt up to a billion dollars, and it's largely because of the spending that Aurora is obliged to undertake. I feel like we've exhausted not just questions but speeches at this rate, but are there any further questions of the report? Councillor Raddick. Uh, yes, given that item, the line item we're just talking about in option two amends the, cap the planned capital expenditure program. Could we, in fact, uh, reduce the um, planned capital expenditure item uh, program by 65 million, which is the DCC side of that debt, uh, here today? N no, that, unfortunately, that would require, that's a significant change to the long term plan, which would require a special consultative procedure, but you can do it during both annual plan and long term plan, and th there will be plenty of time to do that. Councillor O'Malley. Are we in fact aligning with um, stuff we've already agreed on in the past, such as the long-term plan and the letter of intent from Aurora? Yeah, as I said, I th in my opening statement, that all, this, all my paper here is doing is enabling previous decisions to be enacted. Um, yeah. It's been moved, Councillor Lord. Is there a seconder? Yep. Seconder, Councillor Benson Pope. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Um, yeah, well, I, I think we've he heard some commentary about why this is happening, but I think one of the things you have to remember is that the debt is not, uh, uh, I don't actually have a problem with much of Councillor Van Der Vis's saying, but it's how you say it. And I think what we've heard from Mr Toombs that in the next couple of years, our debt will go to 927, the group debt, sorry, the group debt, which is not just the DCC, it's not just the companies, it's the combined debt of the whole lot will go to 927 million. Now, I think we, we knew that this would happen two years ago, and two, or a year ago when we set our long-term plan in 2018 to 2028. The, the very opening day we made a decision that we would, um, we would not sell property. Now, from the moment that decision was made, we knew that this time would come because the combined debts would get very, very close to our ceiling of 800, 850. If we had not um, if we had agreed to sell property, and, and I think the figure that we talked about was $60 million or $70 million worth of property, we, we probably wouldn't be having that argument today. So I, I'm, I'm happy to support this. I also just would note that uh, this figure has been, this 850 has been in play since 2011 before I came to Council. Um, in 2011 you were buying houses for 300000 that are now worth 580000 there's been a significant increase in, in income and wages. To compare these figures, um, the, the other side of it, this is not to go out and do spe uh, spending that's not needed either. We've, you, Councillor Van Der Vis has long said that we should invest in our, uh, our pipes, we should invest in our roads, we should invest in infrastructure. And I think as long as we make these decisions around a, a sensible long-term plan, as a council we come up with what we consider are sensible and good decisions. And so I just think, look, we need to support this. Further speakers? Councillor Houlihan. Yes, I will just say um, I fully support having money to fix infrastructure and upgrade it. I mean, it's been needed, it's been delayed, and even though no one likes you know, spending a lot of money and having debt, but our city needs good infrastructure, so I think it's thankfully needing to be done. Nothing further, I'll put it. You're right to reply, Councillor Lord. Sorry, I wanted to speak. Oh, I'm happy to take your indication. Councillor Van Our CFO has said that the DCC is not an outlier in terms of uh, our debt, and uh, he's of course right, because he's simply looking at the DCC part of it, the part that Mayor Cull was interested in looking at all of last year, or all of this year, uh, and not interested in looking at, at the bigger picture. Um, the uh, not, not being an outlier amongst New Zealand councils doesn't give me any comfort, especially when you see the way some of these other councils are run, and some of them are actually quite considerably worse than us, as uh, Mr Toombs' uh, percentages have pointed out. However, it's, uh, our DCC spending is not the issue here. Our DCC spending, I think someone mentioned 65 million extra, is not what the elephant in the room is. The elephant in the room, and the elephant has been in the room since at least 2010, is Aurora with Delta commingled as they were 
for most of that time. We have a situation where in 2010, I strongly recommended looking at Aurora previous performance and looking at Aurora's enormously uh, expensive way of going about trying to catch up on deferred maintenance that we should have sold Aurora back then in 2010 since any private company would be able to do that deferred maintenance for a fraction of the cost that Aurora does it for. If you are a developer today and you want to get an underground line put in somewhere or if you want to get a power pole uh, put in somewhere, uh, you have to go to Aurora and you will be absolutely shocked that the price of that pole or underground line is completely uh, unrelated to what it was just a few years ago. I take Councillor Hall's point that we have uh, tougher uh, safety r uh, issues these days and, and that obviously things uh, become more expensive with time. But if you look at what Aurora has done in terms of its spending and the value that it's got for it, in its pole replacement program particularly, replacing thousands of poles that didn't need replacing is obviously not a, an amount of spending that you're going to get a return on. When Councillor Reddick asked the questions about Aurora debt investment and asking whether we were guaranteed to get the money back, uh, I noticed that our Chief Financial Officer demurred slightly. Um, given Aurora's previous performance, my view of it as a businessman would be that we were guaranteed not to get that money back and that we will simply be throwing good money after bad. If and this is the major I told you so for this meeting. If we had sold Aurora back in 2010, if a private company had taken over Aurora and maybe raised our uh, electricity prices a bit, as Aurora are going to do now anyway, we would have been far better off to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. We have continued to indulge keeping Aurora because we as a council didn't have the intestinal fortitude to look at Aurora, see that it actually wasn't an asset, that it was a liability, and that despite repeated attempts to make Aurora work, it simply doesn't. It simply keeps saddling the ratepayer ultimately with unbelievably large increases in debt. We are now, in this decision here, given basically no options. We are now being told we have to kick the headroom uh, requirement up to the billion dollars. Aurora has to keep spending money at absolutely enormous rates and at questionable return for them. And all of this was avoidable if only we as a council had done what we should have as a council, and that is had a closer look at our companies much earlier on. We in this decision here to kick the uh, increase of the issued share capital up to near the billion dollars are simply carrying on the same mistake that this council has made in all the years that I've been here. And that is we're not looking at the fundamental problem, we're not recognising that we have a serious liability in at least one of our companies, if not two of them. And we are simply going to in, uh, saddle the next generation with a whole lot of debt for which we may get no return. Thank you, Councillor. Thanks for hearing me out. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. I have something very short to say, and that's that uh, my colleague mentioned the bigger picture, and I think that's really important. And the bigger picture, in fact, is that we're investing in our city in this decision in a responsible way and at a time when it is fiscally advantageous to do so due to the low interest rates. And that is what we should be focusing on today. Councillor O'Malley. Um, this item is more just an administrative item that follows up from agreements we've made in the past. And I want to point out that when you're considering debt and it has it affects the ratepayer, it's only the city's debt that affects the ratepayer. The companies are operating effectively independently from the ratepayer. We act as a guarantor with our assets along with the rest of our group, but our group has a massive amount of assets. No one's mentioned cities forest assets today. I mean, the amount of risk that we are under is negligible. Um, we are using this tool to keep our interest rates down to give favourable terms for all of our companies. Aurora is going through an investment phase. 
why would have we looked at that company any differently than a buyer? If we put it on the market, would the buyer have not looked at the books and come to the same conclusion that Councillor Vandervis came to, which means they wouldn't have paid any money for it? Um, and you know, and when has a private point of order? Point of order, Councillor Vandervis. I made the point quite clear that a private company would have made money out of it because they were quite capable of running it properly, unlike the way our dysfunctional companies have been run for a what long is, time. What is the point of order? The point grounds? of order is that uh, my, what I have said has been completely misrepresented by Councillor oh, O'Malley. I'm fine to take that back because I just want to finish one point and that is Aurora is under the Commerce Commission because it effectively provides a monopoly to its, presume, to its consumer. Um, so would the private companies as well. But have you ever seen a private company ever supply something as cheaply as it can to its consumer when it has a monopoly? So, you know, the other thing we need to always consider is, is it, is it in our favour to own Aurora or to get rid of it anyway? Let alone the fact that what we're doing today is simply an administrative act to follow up decisions we made months ago. Thank you. Councillor Reddick. Sorry, I agree with Councillor O'Malley. And uh, the thing with Aurora is that I believe, just like the electricity uh, generation companies, if it had been sold privately, we'd see a rapid doubling of our line charges. We are in a position where we're going to increase the line charges because of the deferred maintenance. The line charges should have gone up a little and often over the last few decades. Instead, we have to play catch up. So unfortunately, they will see a rise in the order of 20%. But where we see the electricity generators around this country, uh, the electricity price has all doubled. So I think we're saving actually the uh, electricity users of the province some money by doing what we're doing. Uh, thank you, Councillor. I think many people will remember the promise of Max Bradford's reforms and that the private sector was going to drive down uh, electricity prices, and it turns out uh, that hasn't been the case. Councillor Lord, you're right of reply. Well, look, I would, I would just say that I would reiterate the point. Look, we do need to do this, but I just really would reiterate the point. This is not just about a raw spending. DCC, over the uh, long-term plan, made a decision that we would increase our debt from in the vicinity of 200 million to very close to 400 million. So that is one of the huge drivers in this. And in fact, the last statement of intent I saw, I think Aurora had actually reduced the amount, not the reduced their debt, but they'd reduced the amount that they said they were going to spend. So I just think that should be noted as well. And uh, hope you Thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Division, Aye. please. I'll have it taken by division. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Alder. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Reddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 13-1. Uh, thank you. At this point, I'll move uh, that we adjourn for 15 minutes. No shortage of seconders. Seconded, uh, <laughs> Councillor Gary. Uh, I'll put it all those in favour. Those Aye. against. And we'll be back here at 3.30. Thank you. Cool. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, item 25 uh, is a uh, code of conduct investigation. Uh, for the purposes of this item, uh, I'd like to move that we suspend Standing Order 20.2 as it refers to the length of time people can speak uh, in a council meeting. Do I have a second? A second to Councillor Gary. I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Thank you. Um, in terms of speaking to the item, Dr <coughs> Bidrose uh, will, will speak and Mr Garbutt uh, is here, Council's Council, uh, for that purpose. Um, Councillor Vandevers has been offered the opportunity to speak to the item and has accepted that invitation, uh, so he will do so um, and then withdraw from the substantive item. Uh, after Councillor Vandevers has spoken, there will be an opportunity for councillors to ask questions of and through the Chief Executive um, as, as required uh, before moving on to uh, the, the substantive debate. So, uh, Councillor Vandervis. 
When you say withdraw, is that sit back or leave the room entirely? Uh, I'll take advice. My understanding was just to sit back from the meeting, which I'm more than comfortable with. Sit back from the table. Thank you. We're all yours. Councillor Vanivis. Since being elected in 2004, I have never accepted any rate paid travel to conferences or sister city visits, never accepted any DCC business contracts, never had a paid chairmanship, and I've refused to barter my vote. I've exposed and voted against many millions of DCC dysfunction. The claim here that I've tried to avoid a $12 parking ticket is ridiculous. As a councillor, I call out local government dysfunction with my loud, clear voice, and I am tall with facial hair, which some people find intimidating. I do not intend to change any of this. This code of conduct complaint has significant importance to all elected representatives, as although I am the person that suffers this trumped up code of conduct accusation on this occasion, it could happen to any of you in the future. My first point is that I did not engage in the conduct claimed by the complainant and the investigator, and I'm sure that if he had investigated the matter fairly, then he would have reached the same conclusion. My lawyer's letter of 25.11.19 sets out the response that I would have made if the complaint had been fairly put to me. And you can judge for yourself whether the staff's summary of that letter sets out the defence that I would have made if I'd been given the opportunity. My second point is that I was not provided with basic natural justice rights, despite being guaranteed those rights under the DCC Code of Conduct. I was not able to see the complaint or any of the witness statements and did not know until after I received the final report from the investigator that the staff member had falsely claimed that I was trying to have a park it ticket set aside, which would be a clear breach of the code of conduct. What I was trying to do was to report a malfunctioning, mislabeled parking meter, none of which is my fault, uh, and these were the reasons for the inappropriate ticket a ticket which I had fully paid for the amount of time that I would spent parking, uh, and which I have frequently uh, done in the past verbally to DCC customer services as the appropriate council procedure. I had made similar complaints of parking metres to customer services prior to this event, and have made them since, as parking metre faults are extremely common. My lawyer, Len Anderson QC, has advised me that I have good grounds for applying for a judicial review of any adverse decision made by the Council because of the failure of the investigator to adhere to the basic principles of natural justice. My QC expects that Chief Executive Bidrose would have received exactly the same advice from Anderson Lloyd if that question had been asked. The third point is that it was only after I made a complaint about the staff member's refusal to accept my complaint that this code of conduct complaint against me was made. Councillors in the future may be unwilling to make complaints about staff members if there is a real risk of such complaint resulting in a tit-for-tit -tit <coughs> anonymous code of conduct complaint against the councillor, with the attendant risk of damaging the councillor's reputation, particularly when senior DCC staff are not prepared to ensure that there is a fair hearing and that privacy rights are not breached. My fourth point is that staff members, other than the Chief Executive, do not have the right to make code of conduct complaints. The complainant was misled on this count. My lawyer has been told that this complaint was made by our Chief Executive. Only three people should have known about the fact that there was a Code of Conduct complaint. The Chief Executive, her assistant and the investigator. My privacy was breached at a critical time of the election campaign by that complaint being leaked and made public 
and extensively reported in the ODT and on social media. The ODT refers to its source as being, quote, a council spokeswoman, unquote. One example being the ODT article of 26-9-2019. No action seems to have been taken either on my complaint of breach of privacy or on my complaint against the staff member. So it should be no surprise that I consider this whole issue to be politically motivated. The fifth point is that Councillor Benson Pope should not participate in any way in this hearing, as his Target Daily Times article of 24.5.19 claims my supposedly abusive emails, since debunked, exhibit such ill will against me that no reasonable person could consider that he would give me a fair hearing in any code of conduct hearing. I invite you to view the video of the alleged loud, aggressive and intimidating behaviour so you can see for yourself that my behaviour was not inappropriate and there was no obvious concern shown by either the staff member or other people in the vicinity. During the entire three minute video, you will see 11 people passing within four metres of me talking. The only one stops for three seconds to look my way. Most likely, this number six passerby was not looking at me, but checking the time on the digital clock on the wall immediately above the complaining officer's computer screen. I'm happy for you to view the video now. Make your decision on what little hard evidence there is and recognise that the video, unfortunately without audio, is the only hard evidence that you have, the rest of it being mere hearsay. Looking forward to answer any questions afterwards, after you've seen the video, if at least some elected representatives have a desire to give me a fair hearing. Thank you, Lynn. At this stage, I'm dialing up my cell phone to show the custom services officer the photograph of the parking machine that has the $4 per hour advertised on it and the parking machine ID number. She is not interested in taking down the number or recording the fact that the mislabeled machine uh, needs to be corrected. It has since been corrected. Uh, uh, and for this reason, I'm having to explain to her that I am there to complain about the machine and her saying that I'm trying to get off with the parking ticket is not the issue. Neighbour's finger wag, that's where I'm explaining that I am there to let her know that there is a problem with the parking machine that has given rise to this particular ticket, and it's the problem with the parking machine that she needs to address. I explain that I am the customer, and that her job as a uh, officer for the customer services is to take down the details and log the issues that I have presented.
I explained to the customer services officer that I was told to take a photograph of the machine and to present this to the DCC to show what my issue was with the machine and explain that I had paid for more than the full amount of time that I'd parked there. Sorry, I'd missed the fact that I had also paid a $40 ticket before I put my wallet away and left. I was quite happy to pay the other $40 ticket uh, because it was a fair cop. Actually, even that wasn't such a fair cop. The reason I got the $40 ticket was the machine wouldn't accept $2 coins. It kept spitting them out, and I had no time to go to another machine, so I accept that was my fault. I hadn't given myself enough time to go to a second machine. I look forward to any questions that you might have. I wasn't anticipating, um, Councillor, you fielding questions at this point, but it has been helpful to have you to speak to the item. I, I will invite questions from councillors through the chief executive of the, of the report that is at hand. Um, Mr. I, made it, I made it clear, Your Worship, in my final line of the email that I sent to all of you yesterday that I'm happy to answer questions. Yep, that's, at, been, at, that's been noted. Thank you. Mr Garber, are you joining us? Or just here in reserve? That's fine. <coughs> questions? So you, you're sitting back from the meeting at this point, Councillor Vandivers? Oh, I thought I was here to answer questions. No, that, we're not. Okay. That's, it's not appropriate at this point. Questions of the report. Councillor Benson Pope. Oh, it's just a question around the process, Mr Chairman. I mean, it's been characterised a couple of times by Councillor Van der Vis as a hearing. Uh, that's not my understanding. It's, can I have it confirmed? The status clarified. It was my understanding this was a report received from Mr Benham, an independent investigator, who's reported at the Chief Executive's request on the complaint. That's correct. So the business of the meeting is to consider whatever it wants to do with the report and whatever else it might want to do, but it is not hearing the issue. No, that, that's the job of the investigator. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Elder? Um, just in relation to evidence, is there any um, Photoshop of the scan on Lee's phone regarding the um, particular um, parking fine or par um, yeah? Is there any evidence of that? So there's a separate piece of work underway uh, to look at the money councillor Van der says he put it into the machine, the labelling on the machine. Um, however, a code of conduct breach is noted in the report. Uh, the, what councillor Van der feels is the provocation for behaviour isn't the subject of the code of conduct breach. The code of conduct breach simply looks at how the code of conduct outlines councillors are expected to treat staff and was there a breach. So the issue of provocation as a separate <coughs> process, if you yes. like. Yes, I understand it, but it's just um, verifying that. Councillor Lord. Oh, sorry, Councillor Lord. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, oh, I've just lost my wording. You? you just made the comment about the code of conduct is about the behaviour, not the provocation from behaviour. Was there any validity to Councillor Vandivis's claims that the staff member concerned doesn't have the right to make a code of conduct breach, or is that the staff member? Um, should I address is, that to Mr. Garber? Yeah, it, it's in the final page of your report on the legal issues, which was um, which was from via Mr. Garbutt. Um That was one of the issues raised. The, although the staff member used the term that they wanted to make a code of conduct complaint. Uh, it is actually me that raised the complaint with the investigator and hired the, co the investigator, a staff member or a member of the public can't do that. So that has to go through. And so in that sense, you might argue I did it on her behalf, if you like, because the behaviour wasn't about me, but it was me that raised the complaint with the investigator, which is required by the Code of Conduct. And that we've had legal advice and, and given Councillor Van der Vis's lawyer that legal advice. Councillor Elder. Um, just another question, um, and I think it relates to us doing this in public 
rather than in um, um, the confidential part of the meeting, and that is that um, it became public knowledge, and so um, privacy rights were breached. Was as part of the investigation, was there any look at those privacy rights and how that happened, the process of the, how that happened? There's a small amount about that in the report, as best I can find. Uh, on the 23rd of the month, uh, Council of Endivis put the fact that there'd been a complaint up on the website. I didn't receive a complaint about a lack of privacy, or not that I can find, not that I recall, and certainly not that I can find an email. Um, and I don't know whether anybody else did because a couple of key staff were away, but as I outlined in the report. Um, however, he is incorrect to say that only my PA and I and the investigator had access to that information. Of course, the complainant had full access to that information and was entitled to tell anybody she chose. Uh, um, numerous other people saw the event. Uh, we know there was a lot of discussion about it in the building and about whether or not she might lay a complaint because there'd been a lot of other discussions in public about bullying by councillors of staff, for example. So it was a hot issue in council at the time. We didn't do an investigation because, as far as I'm aware, no complaint was made. Councillor Reddick. At this stage, we're just questioning the report rather than... Correct. Yep. Yep. Any further questions? No? Yep. Councillor benson Pope. Well, it's just a, question, a comment, really, um, probably for Mr Garber, that I wonder if we could ask him if he has um, any reservations about the process that was followed by the Chief Executive in light of what's been claimed um, and um, whether the process and the investigation was robust in terms of people's rights. And that is best answered by Mr Garber, as I have been at pains <coughs> to have absolutely no contact with the investigator. Yes, thank you, Councillor. Uh, good afternoon. <coughs> My name's Garbett. I work at Anderson Lloyd. I've provided advice to the Chief Executive uh, throughout this process on the legal issues that have been raised. Um, in terms of the items that Councillor Vandevers has raised uh, this afternoon, he's consistently argued throughout this process via his solicitor and obviously here today that uh, he hasn't received uh, fairness or natural justice in the process. And that was one of the first questions that we were certainly asked by the Chief Executive uh, to analyse, and I've certainly done that uh, multiple times because it's been raised several times. Um, I am satisfied that the process has been fair and consistent with the Code of Conduct. The, the Code sets out quite clearly the process that needs to be followed, um, and I'll just summarise that for you. It requires um, that the process complies with a number of principles, and these are principles of natural justice, and they are that the uh, person complained about has the right to know an investigation is underway, uh, are given due notice and provided with an opportunity to be heard, uh, have a right to seek appropriate advice, and be represented, and finally have their privacy respected. <clears throat> so we've certainly worked through those and considered uh, Mr Benham's report in light of those principles. Uh, and it was clear to me in looking at all the material, yes, Councillor Vandevers was well told that a code of conduct investigation was underway. He was emailed directly by the Chief Executive and Mr Benham in his report records that he spoke to the Councillor indicating that that was the purpose of the meeting and he was in Dunedin to carry out a code of conduct investigation. He had interviewed witnesses and was uh, discussing the, the matter with the, with the Councillor concerned. So, I'm satisfied he well knew what was going on in terms of the process. Uh, Mr Benham outlined the substance of the allegation and that was about the councillor's behaviour. Uh, clearly that's been refuted um, by a councillor and that's your job to, to decide uh, in light of the report whether uh, that is the case. He had the right to be represented. Um, he's certainly had legal counsel through and, and had assistance here um, in preparing for today, I understand. Um, and in terms of his privacy, that was certainly respected by Mr Benham throughout the process, and Mr Benham provided his report to the Chief Executive. I recommended that the Chief Executive put this on the public excluded part of the agenda to respect the Councillor's privacy through this process, and via his solicitor he expressly asked that it be in public, uh, so the Chief Executive um, at that point, following advice from me, that 
if the councillor wasn't concerned about protecting his own privacy, then it's not the job of the council to do that because it was his interest we were. So, all those respects, I have been across the issues and, and liaising with the chief executive and am satisfied that the principles of natural justice and fairness in the code have been followed. Uh, and the chief executive summarised that in detail in the appendix to her report. So. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Council Lord, you've indicated a willingness to move. <coughs> Can you use your microphone? Sorry. Sorry, yeah, I'd sent some words through to Lynn earlier. I'd just like to move that the council accept the, I can't even read it now, accept the findings of David Benham's investigation and issue a written censure to Councillor Vandivis. Is there a second for the motion? Second to Councillor Gary. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor Lord? Well, um, yeah, I'm happy to speak to it. So, so basically, I, um, my situation was the same day I walked into the, the same day of the alleged complaint, I walked into the Civic Centre to speak to someone. I'd actually made a meet, uh, an appointment to see a staff member, and a different staff member told me that staff member was sick, and I just talked to that person in conversation, and they told me their account of what had happened. This is a staff member that I know well and trust that what they told me was reliable and what they told me was that this was an embarrassing situation and that uh, Councillor Vandivis had been um, loud. Um, so beyond the video having no words, we can't see that, but I accept and, and trust this person's thing. Um, I, I think uh, even with what Councillor Vandivis has said, I, I, I have no um, comment to make about the content of what was said. I accept the report, but I would also say if it was different to the report, I still feel uncomfortable with the behaviour when somebody's behaviour is loud and um, not satisfactory. So whether or not Councillor Vandivis was trying to get off a $12 ticket or whether he was complaining about the metre, I don't think the way he went about that was appropriate and I don't think that's an appropriate way um, to deal with staff. So either way, I just feel that that's, um, we, we've got a report here that uh, has interviewed nine witnesses. Um, whether that uh, interviewed the person I know, I'm not sure. Uh, but one of them wasn't a member of the public and I don't believe all those staff and the member of the public have any, I've no reason to believe they're all politically motivated and this is all a vendetta. So um, I'm just uh, thinking this is a conclusion. I'm not suggesting anything other than a written censure. I'm not suggesting that we should um, take away voting rights or anything else like that. It's just, um, an indication from this council that that sort of treatment of staff, be it um, can, uh, admitted or not, is not acceptable. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Reddick. Yeah. Um, well, I think Councillor Vandivis has been accused of attempting to influence an employee to benefit his own interests, as in the report, uh, and by trying to get off a $12 parking ticket. Yet. Um, you know, he paid a $40 one on the same day, and we've got a whole code of conduct hearing going on about that. Uh, whereas people every day of the week go in to try and get off, um, you know, $12 parking tickets. Uh, it's, so it's been getting quite a big uh, issue here about a very small matter. And he says that he wasn't trying to get off the ticket. He was trying to uh, report the machine, which he's, you know, probably quite frustrated about, seeing as, it gave him a, seeing as he ended up with a ticket because of it. And to me, that video doesn't show much shouting or loud-looking discourse coming from Mr. Van Der and neither does it look to me like he storms away. So, I mean, I, I struggle to say that he wasn't uh, that he was treat that he wasn't treating the staff member with courtesy and respect. And of course, his point is that the staff member failed to treat Mr. Van Der with impartiality by not taking his complaint about the machine. So he's complained to the staff member about the parking meter and then that complaint's been not taken. So he's complained about that staff member. So that staff member's complained to the CEO. So now the CEO complains to us. So, uh, you know, we have quite a lot of complaint going on here about not very much at all. So it's no surprise then that the question of election influence is front and centre uh, in Mr. Vandivis's mind. 
and similarly we had the report in the ODT at a pivotal uh, moment in the campaign in September with no uh, commentary or balance from Councillor Van Der in the newspaper. So I think it's uh, no wonder that he's uh, concerned about the question of election inter inter interference or influence. Um, so I think I'm very reluctant to be uh, censoring him um, over this matter. For the speakers, Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. I want to focus on the main issue here. Uh, in Mr Benham's report, it's about a breach of the code of conduct. It's around the treatment of our staff. We have a duty of care to our staff as an employer through our chief executive. Our staff come to work every day to do the best job they can. They're passionate and committed, in my experience, to doing the best job they can for the city. And they deserve, and we have a legal requirement from a health and safety perspective, to ensure that they are treated with respect. This is what this code of conduct is about and focuses about, and there is no other option but to accept the report and provide censure as per the motion. If we are going to be responsible employers. Councillor O'Malley. Um, I think the other point to point out is that when someone who's been involved directly with something is giving testimony, it's testimony, not hearsay. Um, as the councillor said, this is hearsay. It's actually the person's witness testimony of what they said happened. And I'm just looking at something in the report where Councillor Van Der said upon parting, I did not say I will see you in court. He said, if you want to take this to court, I'm happy to argue. It just seems unlikely to me that a staff member would have said, I'm going to take you to court. Um, so I feel that this little bit of evidence that we have in front of us will be more consistent with, with the um, complaint that, in fact, they were treated rather aggressively. And I think we're held to a high standard. And to some extent, our standard has to be held higher than the general public. And it's in the consistency of all those things that I would accept going forward with this recommendation as it is. Councillor Houlihan. Um, yes, I, I just first of all want to say that I don't condone councillors being rude to staff in any way. Um, I will also say that I actually had the same issue with the parking meter. Um, I got two tickets and that was clearly the signage was very misleading, I have to say. However, the issue today I don't think is around the parking meter. Obviously there was an issue with the parking meter, but um, the issue is, in my opinion, looking at this, is, is the way it was handled. And from hearing what Councillor Lord said, um, and I, I, you know, not saying I don't believe some others and some other people, but if Councillor Lord has spoken to you know, eight people, also it's consistent with what the investigator has said, I think um, a censure seems fair. Um, and it's actually, you know, what I'm, I would like to perhaps have a bit of clarification around is a censure, could I ask a question now or not? I'm not sure if, but my question would be, if I was allowed to ask a question, is, is a censure us just saying we don't accept this sort of behaviour and, and that would be pretty much it? Is that what a censure would be? Effectively, yes. Okay, thank you very much. So yeah, that's what I'd like to say, is that I do believe that um, Councillor Van Der had a, a valid issue with the parking meter. It was um, not clear. And um, however, I think the way it was handled was, it seems, um, unreasonable. And I don't think any councillor should be, um, we have to be held at a higher standard. We should treat, ideally treat the um, staff with respect. Who are the speakers? Councillor Staines. I, I will be both for the censure. I think when you look at the report from the investigator. I can't believe that 11 witnesses, and in the terms in here, all the people interviewed that witnessed the incident, including the member of the public, were consistently of the same view as expressed by, uh, by the complainant. So I can't believe that there were 11 people who disliked Councillor Vandivis and wished to politically harm him at the time in the customer area. So I, I think, for me, I, I, 
there's conclusive evidence that while the councillor may not have thought that he was being aggressive, uh, he was. Uh, and certainly the fact that the staff member was deeply upset, um, in the words of this report, would suggest to me that the behaviour was not that that we would expect of a councillor. Um, so I, I will be voting for ascension. Councillor Lord, your right of reply. Sorry, Councillor Benson Pope. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm glad that most speakers have actually focused on the investigator's report because that. It... You've withdrawn from the meeting, Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Benson Pope. Um, <clears throat> that's the key issue here, uh, and I want to compliment the Chief Executive on choosing that process rather than the other processes that have been followed historically to deal with complaints of this kind, because a hearing by peers um, that has happened previously has also not been, has not um, <clears throat> given as unequivocal uh, or less contentious outcome um, that, as this has. Uh, I don't think there can be any doubt, as Councillor Staines has pointed out, um, on, the, on the evidence presented by Mr Benham uh, that the behaviour occurred. And I think it will be a gross insult to the staff member or members um, who have had to, had to put up with this sort of behaviour for us not to support the censure that is recommended. Further speakers, Councillor Officer. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. I just want to record my thanks to the complainant, the staff member, for having <coughs> the, the Manosi and the Kaha to follow through, especially when um, dealing with someone who is far more powerful than she. I also want to record my thanks to the CEO and the investigator and um, Mr. Garbutt for their work on this issue. If it was up to me personally, I would be calling for councillor, the councillor's resignation. I think in this day and age, the, the um, violence and abuse expressed towards staff members, in particular women, has to end in this day of the 21st century. It is violence, and we should have no tolerance for violence of any kind. The speakers. Councillor Elder. I think we've all had the experience of paying a ticket that we didn't want to. Um, but as a councillor, um, in particular, as a role model, we need to be able to not lose our rag. And from the sounds of things, from the evidence, it appears it, there was an inappropriate response and one that upset people. And on the evidence also, Mr Lord, who has um, verified that with the staff, I think um, accepting D David Benham's investigation and issuing a censure to Mr Van Der Vies is the right response. So I support it. Councillor Walker. Um, feeling slightly moved, I just want to um, thank Councillor Lefiso for her brave and pertinent comment. Councillor Lord, your right of reply. Yeah, well, there's not really anything that I need to say except <clears throat> just in response to Councillor Reddit. Um, I don't think this is about necessarily a $12 ticket either, but I think the end of the day is if you're coming in with the expectation that you are going to draw staff's attention to a fault, that's also going to have the effect of mitigating the $12 ticket if that's proven to be correct. But I don't think, and I, I make it very clear, this is not about a $12 ticket in my opinion, this is about the behaviour in the Civic Centre on that day. Um, in response to Councillor Houlihan and Councillor Elder, um, you don't need to feel more confident to vote for this because of something I've said. I'm confident with the content of the report, but I just had it backed up to me personally when I spoke to one of the staff the same day. So. 
Thank you. I'll put the motion and it seems likely that I'll be taking it by division. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lefiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Reddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Walker. Aye. Count uh, sorry, Your Worship. Carried 13 nil. It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, item 26. Uh, we're on to notices of motion. <clears throat> uh, item 26 is um, mine around energy efficiency initiatives. It's been uh, circulated in advance of the meeting. Um, I would ask for a second if one was forthcoming. Second, Councillor Walker. Thank you. Um, in speaking to the motion, as, as has been canvassed uh, already in a, a previous item, there is a, a current uh, case being taken against Aurora Energy by the Commerce Commission by way of uh, the High Court for historic um, uh, breaches of their performance standards, uh, which can draw uh, financial pen penalties of up to $5 million for any given year. It is um, over the course of four years. Uh, the maximum penalty would be for 20 million, um, but the anticipation is that uh, it would be closer to uh, five in total. But I'm not here to argue the merits of the case being taken against Aurora uh, or even what that quantum would be. All I'm asking for is support from this council that whatever the penalty uh, that is, uh, levied against uh, Aurora, uh, that rather than have it go into the Crown's back pocket, uh, it could be better spent in supporting uh, energy efficiency projects, uh, not just in the Dunedin City Council area, obviously, but given the scope of Aurora's network also in Central Otago District Council uh, and the Queenstown Lakes uh, District Council, such that we could put um, the historic poor performance of uh, the network um, a historic poor performance at a network scale uh, to um, better uh, performance uh, at a household scale. I would be asking for this regardless of who owned the energy network, the fact that um, we're the ultimate shareholder uh, d doesn't have significant bearing uh, on this. Um, I did take a, uh, a motion to the recent Otago Mural Forum asking for their support given that this it does span, uh, span the region, and we had uni unanimous support from uh, the Otago Mural Forum to make approaches uh, on government uh, through the Minister for Energy, uh, Minister for Commerce and others uh, to have this uh, reinvested in our community. This isn't related to the current process uh, Aurora are undertaking uh, through their customised price path, but we do know, as has been well canvassed, uh, that, that the historic underinvestment and, and subsequent artificially deflated lines charges that have been levied across the district are to be corrected somewhat sharply uh, in the coming years. Uh, this has the benefit, rather than uh, setting up something that allows for grants uh, to people who are struggling most with accommodating that, uh, this is something that can go into um, energy efficiency um, the energy efficiency projects that in the longer term can offset lines charges by uh, by decreasing the demand, if you like, at a household scale for, uh, for retail energy. And rather than uh, setting up a system that issued grants that people had to return to on an annual basis, uh, a la Council's electricity fund, uh, this is something that can support people uh, in the longer term. Um, I don't think it's adequate, though, just to say, give us the money uh, that's raised, that's levied through the High Court. So uh, part of this is around asking staff to identify options that we can, or what can we do as a council to uh, expand our offering in terms of giving effect to our ambitions uh, around cosy homes uh, and also seeking support from other funding and public agencies uh, to further advance this work. 
um, and I'm open-minded as to who they m might be, whether it's uh, the Otago Community Trust, who have been involved in supporting um, uh, cosy homes and related projects. The Otago Regional Council have been, and obviously the Southern District Health Board have a direct uh, interest because this isn't just about um, money for people in terms of paying the power bill. It's also about uh, trying to get better uh, public health and social well-being outcomes in our community so that fewer people here are living in housing that makes them sick uh, because uh, long before uh, the current discourse around housing affordability took over uh, the conversation. The issue in Dunedin has been um, poor quality of our uh, older building stock uh, and this is, pre presents an opportunity, if you like, to try and address that um, by expanding the offering uh, through, whether it's through retrofitting uh, or other means. But I've kept it as, uh, as enabling as possible to allow for that discussion to evolve with the relevant um, ministers and government departments. So reasonably straightforward, and uh, I welcome uh, colleagues' support for the speakers. Councillor Walker. Oh, sorry, Councillor Houlihan and then Councillor Walker. Oh, it's been seconded. Oh. That's fine. Councillor Walker. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. I'll be slightly briefer than yourself. Um, I guess uh, Aurora upgrades, uh, while strengthening a long neglected uh, network, will undoubtedly put uh, disproportionate financial burden on those most vulnerable and poorer members of our community. Therefore, I fully support initiatives that in any way help to alleviate that burden. Councillor Vanivis. Supporting initiatives that will give extra money to cosy homes is all well and good, and we can do that at any time of the year. Uh, and we often send submissions to government uh, to that effect. This particular motion, however, basically uh, is that the DCC wishes to tell the government what it's going to spend an extra $5 million, if that's what it turns out to be, an extra $5 million of fine money on cosy homes in initiatives. And to me, that's simply delusional. If you've been fined, the purpose of the fine is to let you know that you've transgressed quite significantly and that the behaviours that Aurora has been involved in for many years now are simply unacceptable. And it's come to a point where potentially there was $20 million worth of fines that could have been levied, uh, reduced to $5 million basically to make sure that the point was made, even though they know very well that Aurora is uh, in a massive financial hole. I agree that we should spend more money on insulation, we should spend more money on solar panels, we should spend more money on distributed generation, and we should lobby the government to do that, and I think we have done uh, through the normal submission process. To try and do it under these circumstances, I think, quite frankly, is posturing, and it will be seen that way by the government. How dare the DCC tell it what it's going to do with its crown largesse, especially fine monies from a council that has failed to have adequate oversight over its companies for decades? What kind of message would be going to all the other taxpayers in the country if somehow we the people who've invited uh, these fines uh, somehow can decide where those fine monies will go. I can't see how this could possibly fly in government, and I'm actually a bit embarrassed that it's being put forward here. I won't be voting for it. Councillor Houlihan. Uh, I'd like to say that um, uh, probably to an extent, Councillor Vandervis is possibly a little bit correct that it probably is unusual to ask for money, you know, that a company might be fined to come back to a community. But you know what? I think it's really entrepreneurial. I think it's ballsy and good on you. And I think that the government will sit up and say, oh, look at this. That's quite innovative. It's bringing money back to this community. And they'll say, good on them. And the other mayors are supporting you as well. Well done, Your Worship. <laughs> Thank you. That's a technical term. Councillor O'Malley. <laughs> 
be supporting it. I just um, do think that the pushback from the government will be that because the DCC is the owner of Aurora, it'll have to be made sure that this money goes into such a place like Cosy Homes. So it's clearly not coming back to us, because otherwise the shareholder will be asking to have a fine redistributed to somewhere else on its books. Um, but other than that, I don't really see an issue, but I think we just have to be ready for that government argument back. Councillor Reddick. Yes, um, I agree. I think there, there's a reasonable chance that the government might see this as a worthy uh, reinvestment of the money in, back into the community and, as uh, Councillor Walker, Walker pointed out, back to the um, people that need it most. Uh, it, on the face of it, it doesn't look um, very likely, but you never know. In the current environment, I think it would be uh, foolish not to try. I think it's a good idea to try. Oh, oh, sorry, Councillor Staines, then Councillor Elder. I'll definitely be supporting this. And in, in many ways, when you look at who was disadvantaged, it was those customers of the network. So this, this prosecution is because Aurora failed to meet the SADI and SAFI uh, measures that are set down for them as an organisation. It's the breach of those. By breaching those, they have disadvantaged the customers on the network, and so I think there is a very good argument to say, don't give it to us, DCC, but put it somewhere where it can assist the customers of the network to improve their energy efficiency. So I think it's a, a great proposal, and it has my full support. Councillor Elder. I do support this, and I commend Councillor Hood and I'm very supportive of it. We had a unanimous, unanimous um, support from the mayor reform. Sorry, can you turn your microphone? Oh, we, we have a unanimous um, support from the mayor reform forum, and the people who are going to pay the cost for some of the um, um, delayed maintenance are those who are on set incomes and the, and the vulnerable, because they haven't got the excess income to pay for those, and often they're in situations um, of rental properties or their own properties which they cannot afford to do up. So I think looking at long-term solutions um, to these um, problems is a really good um, contribution and use of that five million. And I believe that if we argue the case, I'm sure that we at least can have a good punt at this and at least have a good case to um, persuade them to do so. So I support it. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, briefly, if you don't ask, you don't get. And um, this is a win-win. It's a win for our people in our community. It's also a win for the government, if they agree to it, because it makes them look damn good. Thank you, Your Worship. With the speakers. Just in exercising my right of reply, and, and I should have made it clearer at the beginning, and, and it's drafted ambiguously on purpose. It's certainly absolutely not my intention, nor what I ever anticipated would be successful to make a pitch to government to have the money redirected back to us, uh, the ultimate shareholder of the company that is being fined for historic um, performance breaches. It would have to sit somewhere uh, external. Uh, I've, I've no fixed view of where that would be, but I think you know, the chances are fairly unlikely um, would be a generous way of putting it, um, where we to put our hand up to ask for it back uh, straight into our own um, back pocket, as it were. Uh, I will put the motion by division, please. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Councillor Elder? Aye. Councillor Gary? Aye. Councillor Hall? Aye. Councillor Houlihan? Aye. Councillor Lefiso? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Councillor O'Malley? Aye. Councillor Raddick? Aye. Councillor Staines? Aye. Councillor Vandervis? Aye. Councillor Walker? Aye. Your Worship? Aye. Carried 13-1. Thank you. Uh, item 27, notice of motion, Sinclair Beach. Uh, Councillor Raddick, in your name, do you have a seconder? Councillor O'Malley, I invite you to speak to the motion, Councillor Raddick. Uh, yes. Um, 140 years ago, around 1878, uh, the first of the sea walls was built at St. Clair and smashed to smithereens quite shortly after. 
and thereafter followed about 20 years of wall building and destruction with uh, ongoing reports and talks and uh, increasing rubble of the old, the former seawalls uh, strewn, uh, strewn across the beach. In 1902, uh, it was decided to work with nature instead of against her, and the first groins were built. And so a groin is just simply a wall straight out from the sand dunes uh, with uh, gaps between the fence palings. It's like a fence straight into the surf. And the um, wave action that we have on our beach uh, smashes against that wall and the sand held within those waves falls down and builds up the beach. So we use uh, nature to, to work, we work with nature to capture that sand and build up the beach by several metres. And so those uh, groins lasted till about 1921. They were repaired then, they had some new ones built. And then again in 1955, and the, the, um, some particularly, two particularly good ones were rebuilt in 1955, and that's the remains of one of those that you can see on the beach right now. And that lasted and kept that beach um, two or three metres higher for essentially 100 years, from 1902 through to about 2000, protecting the sand hills and protecting the seawall at the Esplanade. But over the last 20 years, uh, all we have left now is a few poles. The poles have gradually disappeared and the planking along the side of them is gone. And uh, consequently, the sand hills have been eroded steadily. And we had very large storms in, in 2007 and 2013, which did quite a lot of damage to the Esplanade and a lot of damage to the adjacent sand hills, which cost over a million dollars in each case to repair. And uh, I think, you know, by the process, by uh, just symmetry from 2007, 2013, we're due again this coming winter, 2020. But not, that's not to say that would happen, but the balance of probability is uh, increasing. So I think it um, would be a very useful thing for us and afford a measure of protection for the uh, landfill at Kettle Park if we were to rebuild that groin. Uh, just the same as it was because it's been shown and the uh, regional council has agreed that no resource consent is required to rebuild an existing coastal structure and that would give us a measure of protection and insurance for that landfill while the uh, infrastructure department can proceed with their comprehensive plan to protect the coastline right along Ocean Beach from uh, Lawyers Head through to St Clair Hot Saltwater Pool. Uh, and so that's why I'm calling for a report from the staff to assess the feasibility of and options for reinstating the existing groin structure, including an assessment of the risks and benefits of that groin, and referring to a kettle park, and of course the risks of doing nothing. And with that, they can give us a construction time, cost estimate, and a, strate a strategic assessment of its effects on the wider coastal system and their existing, you know, our existing uh, work program. Thank you for the speakers. Councillor O'Malley. Um, I'm going to support this because um, I've worked with Councillor Radich about this as he's come on to Council and I think it's a challenge when you first get onto the Council to put your wishes and aspirations into the system and make sure that it actually works with the system as it's going. There's ongoing work already on this area of the coast and um, this particular request for this report sort of jumps it up a little bit into the existing work program, but it doesn't cause so much disruption as to completely destroy the existing work program, I guess would be the best way to describe it. Um, and I do believe you need to support um, ambitious views for people coming on because it, it's part of our electoral process. But we have to remember that we uh, have a governance role and these notices of motion must be used with caution in terms of how many times we view it because every time we do this is effectively an operational effect. Um, I do think that the um, infrastructure department is, is relatively happy to, to deal with this, and so it's, I think it's a good, a good exercise in going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have a long association with the Tauroni Beach Coast Care Committee and the work of that community group around a solution for coastal erosion, and one of those solutions at one time was a groin. Um, of a particular kind. And what I learned over the very uh, long period that that project has been driven by the, by the community is that there are many different solutions uh, to the problem. 
And uh, with all due respect to the councillor, um, and I'm certainly not a coastal, coastal erosion expert at all, uh, but what I do know is that it's part of a wider piece of work to identify um, the possible solutions. The groins would be one of those I would expect, uh, and that that wider piece of work, as I understand it, is already in the work programme. So I won't be supporting this particular motion, but I certainly support the coastal erosion assessment work. Councillor Elder. I was wondering if I may, can I direct a question towards staff related to this project? No, this isn't a staff report. Uh, you can raise questions and either subsequent speakers or the mover can address them if they can in their right of reply. Okay, thank you. Um, what I was, uh, I was thinking is I can support this motion in the context of the greater work that's being done on the ocean view area, which is actually reasonably urgent given the erosion around Kettle Park and the rubbish dump. And so to me it's just raising this at, to another level and making a point about it. And so I can support it as a, a part of the ongoing assessment and urgent assessment needed on the whole ocean view area. Councillor Houlihan. Yes, I'll be supporting this motion. I think um, the beach, you know, particularly St Clair Beach, is a jewel in our crown in our city, and we need to do whatever we can to um, save it, because it's been, I've found it personally quite sad to see the poles just disappearing and disappearing, and I think it's great to see um, a council with so much passion for for this, and I completely support it. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Um, <clears throat> question may be f rather awkward because I can't ask the person who could probably answer it, but I will ask the mover if he might know. So um, I would assume that Tom Dyer and his team would have already included this as part of an erosion mitigation package, and. If I could ask him, I'd ask him what the status is, and if not, what his view would be. Do you have any? Yes, I have okay. a bit to say about that. Councillor that... Reddick, you can address it in your right of reply. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Further I comment? Yeah. Um, well, like most others around the room, I'm not a coastal engineer either, uh, or a meteorologist, or a scientist, or, um, or any remotely capable, skilled background uh, to make an informed decision about this. I don't support this motion because I think that the rebuilding of the groins is the best idea or the best option. Um, but I support the motion because I think there's enough community interest in this proposal that it needs to be considered as part of, uh, not instead of, as part of uh, the wider community consultation that is currently happening uh, around the, the wider coastal system. And we've um, had uh, clarification from the, or comment at least from the Chair of Infrastructure that it um, isn't gonna put that work out. And I think that's, uh, that's helpful to know. So, you know, there are certainly views in our community on both sides of this, but until we do the work, it's pretty hard to make an informed decision around this table about it. And let's face it, it's not like Councillor Reddick is gonna stop talking about it. Uh, so <laughs> at least this will present us the option during the annual plan process uh, to have an informed debate about what we might be doing in that neck of the woods. Councillor Vandivis. I can support this largely because it's really not that expensive. We will learn something from it. And there is value simply in the learning. If it was a half million dollar or a million dollar project, I'm afraid I, 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 I see the evidence not as clearly as Councillor Raddick does. Um, I can see how it might work to some extent, but also have the staff view that it may scour out on the other side of it. Uh, Councillor Raddick has produced some strong arguments to suggest, suggest that uh, he knows better. What I think we need to do is we need to do the experiment I'm gladdened to hear, and I hope it's correct, that we're not going to need ORC permission to do this, that we're not going to have to spend a whole lot of money on uh, resource consents. Um, 
In fact, is there any staff member that can confirm that? It has been said during the meeting. Um, I would like to know that. But in any event, because it's not such a major and um, uh, because Councillor Hall might actually be able to do it even more cheaply than has been suggested, um, I'm suggesting that we just go ahead and let's learn from it. If it works well, we may find ourselves minded to put a few more of them along the beach a bit later. Thank you. For the speakers? That's the red. I reply, yes. Um, I'll just remind the councillors at this stage, well, I'm only asking for a report from staff about the groin and the efficacy thereof, and also how it does actually fit in with the coastal plan. So uh, it is my hope that everyone could support the report from staff. This is their opinion and this is how it sits. Uh, but you know, the opportunity, uh, and it is my hope that the opportunity to uh, decide on whether to actually put it in will come later once we have their report. Thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Division. Take it by division. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Gary. No. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lefiso. No. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Reddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. Yes. Councillor Walker. Aye. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 12 2. Thank you. Item 28, a notice of motion around the octagon closure. Councillor Houlihan has moved it. Do you have a seconder? <coughs> seconder, Councillor Barker, I'll invite you to speak to your notice of motion. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, I think what we saw today, for example, at the chamber was, uh, and not meeting in our council chambers, the speakers that came today highlighted the fact that we need to do more. And now this motion is in no way a criticism on any of the council staff. I want to highlight that because I know there was concern that it might be and it's not. And I want to knock that on the head now and say that I'm, I'm a huge advocate for the council staff and I know that behind the scenes they've been doing a lot to help this. But I think we yeah. owe it to the people of Dunedin, the users of the Octagon, the market vendors, the tour bus operators, the bar owners, businesses and visitors to our city to get this right. And right now I don't think we have. So I think this motion will give us some more time to work on it. And as we heard from some of the submitters today, they most of them are in agreement that if we closed off the bottom half of the octagon but left the top half, people would be happy. And I think we need to consider that. I, and as I said, I know the council staff have been doing a lot of work behind the scenes, talking to different affected parties, and I thank them for this. I also believe that everyone wants the best outcome, as it is not in anyone's best interest to get this wrong. And right now we're getting hammered in the, you know, in the news media, media. We're getting emails sent to us regularly from complaints. It didn't need to be like this. So I think everyone agrees, you know, it could have been handled a bit better. This is important. These decisions do matter. They affect livelihoods, people's jobs, and leave a lasting impression on visitors to our city. Because of this, I think we need to take time to get it right. But we haven't got a lot of time, so it needs to be acted on quite urgently. This motion creates an opportunity to add to the good work council staff have already done, and it shows affected parties that we do care. And we have heard their concerns, because their concerns do matter. Further speakers? Councillor Barker. I support this motion as I believe the, the key issue is around engagement. We have a significance and engagement policy which I believe we need to work harder on to carry the city with us and deliver better outcomes. Our residents' opinion survey for 1819 shows a results show a 43% satisfaction with mayor and councillors, which was down on the previous one. And at 48%, less than half the residents were satisfied with the amount of public consultation undertaking. As a council, undertaken, sorry, as a council, we need to do better. 
In t as Dougal McGowan stated, in 2018, $150,000 was added to the DCC budget by Council to, and I quote from the resolution, to support pedestrian trials and associated activity in the Lower Octagon in Stewart Street. It's vital to note that the trial was intended for the Lower Octagon and it appears no signal or agreement from residents and users was given to trial the whole Octagon. The Octagon is the heart, the hub of our city. When we look to make significant changes, such as trial enclosures for nearly two months, we need to take the community with us. The Octagon is their heart, their hub, in some cases their livelihood. All the users deserve a say on the vision, whether they have a business, visit for leisure, to interact with council, to pop and pick up a prescription, grab a taxi, access the theatre, book a holiday at the eyesight, meet for a coffee or a drink. All our residents and users deserve a say on what their city heart means to them and to help create a shared vision for us all. Dissatisfaction with the recent opt-in experience process is shown, as Carmen said, by the numbers of letters to the editor, emails to council, social media, ODT articles and videos, and calls and emails to councillors, as well as the public forum presentations we listen to today. This level of unhappiness seems to e evidence we haven't engaged positively and need to reconsider how we've engaged and what sort of vision we're asking people to share. I believe we need to take this chance to examine how we engage and reset the Octagon experiment. The Octagon experience trial may be a symptom of council's perceived lack of engagement so let's try to get it right through engagement and co-design with stakeholders. Councillor Reddick. Oh, sorry, Councillor Elder. Then Councillor Reddick. Thank you. I'll be supporting this motion. Why? Because a review of the Octagon closures and an ongoing weekly discussion with stakeholders will ensure the best outcome for the Octagon trials. As demonstrated by the Ed Sheeran experience, Deneen does concerts and events really well. The closure of the lower octagon in Stewart Street, adding to the shared experience. And in fact, Ed Sheeran posted on that experience. When we trial projects, there is an element of trial and error and learning and tweaking and improvements as we go along, as any good business would know. There are two points in the process I believe a review would assist in, in creating a sustainable and lot more long-term outcome for everyone. The first is that the annual plan on the 29th of May 2018, um, the re resolution stated that we had a budget for a trial of the, of the closure of the lower octagon in Stewart Street. There is no resolution to close the whole of the octagon. And it is the closure of the whole of the octagon that is the cause of significant issues, in particular to the cruise ship and tourism industries, as well as our local people visiting the Octagon. As noted in the ODT today, there are concerns over the lack of consultation and that the DCC would approach this differently if we started again. I believe an urgent <coughs> review at this point would be helpful in getting an outcome for the Octagon trial that is, um, for the Octagon trial that is more sustainable and has input input from the stakeholders impacted. Once the core values of the the core values of public participation say the belief that those who are affected by a decision have the right to be involved in the decision making process, and that would be true for us all. We would expect to be involved in decisions related to ourselves. In the case of the closure of the octagon, it has to be considered that there are considerable impacts on our tour op operators, retailers, cruise ship passengers, visual appeal, hospitality industry, and the ability to get information about Dunedin. The octagon is a wonderful hub and a landing place for Dunedin residents and visitors alike. With historic buildings, the Art Gallery, Dunedin Information Centre, and one of the best viewing corridors in the world along Stuart Street to the restored heritage buildings and our famous railway station. Enabling access to all for the Octagon is an important part of the Ox Octagon experience, and that is why I believe in urgent review and um, reconfiguration of what's happening is important. 
Councillor Reddick. Yes, a, uh, a famous person expecting that ordinary people had lots of options at their disposal and that any minor adversity in one area of their lives could be easily overcome by altering their habits to cope and everything would be just fine. Uh, when told that the people had no bread to eat, she said, in all naivety, let them eat cake. <laughs> and in response, the peasants of France rose up in revolt and she paid with her head. And I suggest we take heed of her lesson, lesson and listen to what our citizens have to say. <coughs> Today's democracy is about engagement rather than consultation. It's about asking people what they want rather than telling them what you're going to do to them. Asking people honours their intelligence. Telling denies it. And which would you prefer to happen to you, I ask? It's beholden on us and our administrators and administrative body to engage with our residents and ask them what they want. We're very fortunate that they've come to us today and politely told us what they don't want and provided a range of useful suggestions of what they do want. So I agree with the motion that we review the plan and continue to review it weekly so that it can be fine-tuned as we go to have a better and much more positive outcome for all concerned. I suggest a weekly meeting in the plaza meeting room would be an easy method of conducting that. And perhaps all parties could share and break some bread to remind them of Marie Antoinette when they do so. That's all official. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, although I applaud uh, my colleagues' uh, initiative in this motion, I will not be supporting it because primarily I believe our role is as governors and um, no matter what Councillor Hulasin says, I believe that this motion will signal a lack of confidence in staff. We pay our staff a lot of money and I believe that they've learned lessons um, from the outcry. Personally, I have not received as many um, complaints um, as I did about the Lime scooters. And I think this is a clash of values because the people who are opposed and um, are crying out on this particular issue, because they're not affected by Lime scooters, and the people affected by Lime scooters who are asking us to take some policy action um, are not as powerful or as motivated or as organised. We have, we're having to deal with this today. So I would prefer that we leave it to the staff I'm sure the staff have learnt a lot in this curve and that we should remain as governors and concentrate on the strategic direction in the future. I would just note that planning staff have privately related that they have never encountered so much abuse personally um, while they've been doing the consultation process on, on George Street. So I think we should back our staff up and let them do their work. Councillor Lord. Yeah, look, I, um, I pretty much agree with Marie there, actually. I think pretty much what she said is what I feel. The only thing I would say, and I realise we're not asking staff to answer questions here, but I note that the Chief is sitting there, and I assume she's listening, and I would like to think that she might reconsider the... Um, I've forgotten his name, the second guy that spoke after uh, Dougal, the guy from Dunedin Host. I've forgotten his name, sorry about that. Apologies to him. But... Uh, I think if we could even consider whether or not we may leave one quarter of the option octagon open, and I think, I think to be quite honest, the southern side's a good option. I, I personally would come down because it's easy, but if you want to come up and drop people in front of the theatre, that's fine. But um, as far as this, I'm not going to support this, but I am going to support staff. Councillor Staines. Look, I think we, we can all look back with 2020 vision, and probably what we did was consult on a decision rather than engage before we put the proposal. And for better or worse, that has resulted in an outcry. So I think from my point of view, we're hearing it from many sectors, particularly the tourism sector, the cruise sector, that what we're proposing is going to do us harm and do their businesses harm. So. I think, while I don't, I don't necessarily want to ask for a full review, I just, my personal view is, are we going to cut up our nose to spite our face in order to close the octagon completely? Or are, do we have an open mind and are trying 
as much as we can to allow those cruise passengers to land where I believe they should be landing, which is, which is near, near the octagon. So the proposal that was put up by Dougal, I think he's suggesting the buses run the wrong way, but, but even if we, like my personal view would be if they could access Stewart Street, drop off and pick up alongside the cathedral, not in front of it, because that's where the cruise operators work from, I mean the, the tourism operators work from, and, and pick up from there their access in the top, round the top quadrant of the octagon, out along George Street, onto Moray Place and away. There's a clear route there, and I just want to be sure that we're not discounting that because we want to close the octagon completely. Um, that it, that so that's what I would be asking staff to consider. Uh, I don't think it needs a full review. I think we've all learned, myself included, that how much can go wrong if the process didn't involve good engagement before we announced. Um, so, you know, I think if, if we'd achieved that engagement properly, then we might have actually been able to achieve a complete closure for a period. But I think that's gone unless we want to fly in the face of, pu of the public that are being affected. Um, and I think, so my personal view is we need to look at it and, if possible, change that decision. Elsa Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I want to acknowledge the mobility issues um, mentioned uh, as the reason for where the cruise ship passengers should be dropped off. Um, having guided uh, visitors for a number of years, I certainly saw the limited mobility of a large number of our visitors. However, it was my understanding that the compromise that was reached in terms of where the bus would go um, was a compromise that was welcomed by the bus company and operators, although we've heard today some other views. I think the thing we're not hearing, and this often happens in issues, is we're not hearing the voices of the people who are really happy with uh, this decision to trial. And I say trial because in a lot of the rhetoric, it, you would think we, we had decided to close the octagon period. Um, it is a trial, and I do recall at the time of discussing this before the various motions were put, that we talked about needing to trial a variety of different park closure, uh, et cetera, uh, in different situations so that we could collect data and find various things out. Um, I certainly acknowledge uh, the concern from those that uh, they say it affects. Uh, I have trouble uh, coming to terms with the, the idea that we are going to put a very large number of people in this space, so the fall will increase, and yet people are telling us that that's going to mean a downturn in their business. And the two things um, are just I find really difficult to balance up, quite frankly. So there's clearly more data that needs to be collected. Um, but what I will be voting against, because what I believe I support uh, Councillor Lefiso's comment about being governance as opposed to operational, um, but I would urge staff to continue, as they have in recent weeks, to continue um, to work with stakeholders to reach a compromise. Um, and we heard one of those p possible compromises this morning around the upper segment. Um, so I have confidence that our staff will continue that good work. And we've all learnt lessons from that. There's no doubt whatsoever about that. And we have heard uh, the various members of our community. And that's why staff have been working really hard in the background to come to some compromises. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the problem of going, going later on means I'm going to repeat some of the things, but I, I won't labour them. Um, I certainly just want to um, uh, confirm my feelings around the governance operational sentiments and obviously about uh, backing our hard-working staff. Um, for me, um, I was elected into a governance position. This remains a trial, and the trial will provide data, and without data I cannot as a an elected person in a governance decision make robust decisions. However, it does worry me that there is not a motion to close the whole of, of the Octagon from the previous council. Um, I will not be supporting the motion, but I would like to suggest, and I think others have suggested, that a discussion with staff around the possibility of 
letting the buses access the upper octagon would be, for me, a sensible way to go in terms of alleviating what I have heard today seem to be a high proportion uh, of views against this. Councillor Vanivis. I agree with the intent of the motion, but I worry about how it's worded and how the staff are going to interpret it. The fact is that complete closure of the octagon has been not our decision. It's been something that staff and certain individuals have pushed. And it flies very much in the face, I believe, of what we're here to do, and that is to make such decisions. The timing of the trial, the fact that trials in the past uh, have just simply turned into a soft option for getting something done, and I'm thinking about uh, the trials we had for the left turning in George Street. That was done on the back end of a cigarette packet in some transportation person's lunch hour by their own admission publicly. Um, they just wanted to trial it and it's stayed that way ever since. And in this way, we have a situation where staff, for various reasons, maybe some of them good reasons, uh, think they are better off at making decisions than we are. We, however, are the people that should be making decisions. We are the people that should make the decisions and be liable for unpopular decisions as well. This hasn't happened in this case and the urgently reviews the plans for octagon closures may be interpreted, I'm concerned, by staff as coming out with a review report somewhere in the next year. I think that what we really need is to get staff to understand that actually this closure is not acceptable, that they need to pull back very hard on the uh, idea that they can close the octagon, without our consent, and that this needs to happen in the next few days, not something that we get a report on, uh, as has often happened in the past, in some undetermined uh, future, urgent or not. To discuss the plans thoroughly with all affected parties weekly, again, I like the sentiment, but can't see how you can do it. Uh, the amount of staff resource required to uh, discuss the plans with all affected parties would be quite significant in itself uh, to do it weekly. I would, if I was the chief executive, be struggling with. However, I am prepared to vote for it on the basis that what it says in terms of its intent is that we recognise the strong feedback from the public that this trial closure isn't appropriate, that we as councillors haven't decided it and therefore that staff must pull back and find some accommodation for both uh, the uh, tourist users of the city and for those that are coming for the games, the Masters Games. So hopefully going forward, uh, if we can, especially if we have a, a, a large number of councillors voting for this, um, staff will be more careful about depriving uh, the people of the Neden from the use of certain streets, in this case the cherished octagon, uh, recognise that retailers are actually quite a breed apart. And I'm looking around the table and I think there's very few other people here that have had the 20 years of retail experience I have had. You need a lot of retail experience in order to make a retail business work and retail businesses are of their very nature relatively fragile. You look at the number that come and go. Um, for us to tell retailers what's good for them, you know, more footfall will mean better turnover, is, I believe, inappropriate. I also believe it's inappropriate for staff to tell retailers what is in their best interests. So voting for it and hoping that this doesn't happen again. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Um, I do want people to look at this resolution again and say, not, well, I, the way I'm interpreting it is that 
we're, we don't have much time to talk about this and therefore there's an urgency and it's to review the plans and there's already been a lot of talk about review. I don't think we're, I'm not asking myself for the whole thing to be turned off. I think though, and then we are already meeting with some affected parties at least weekly, sometimes twice a week. So in some respects, this was written about a week ago and the staff have gone a long way down this path. So I'm gonna support this because I don't think we're, we are so far apart and I, and I do think that it needs to show that at a governance level, sometimes we need to say that while you did a good faith piece of work, it was not really what we intended because there is a fair deviation away from the original resolution, which was the lower optimum. And so I do think in that regard, we do have a no surprises um, defence on our behalf to say that we did not think that we were signing off the whole optimum at the time. And I think some people may say that's semantics, but I think that's specifics because you, you need to know that when you say something, that's, that's going to be the guts of the plan. And therefore, if you said the lower half of the octagon, it's a big surprise to find the whole octagon came out later. I, I want to take this to a much higher order qu question of all of us, and, and Councillor Stain start, touched on it. If you go back to the Local Government Act and you look at the definition of the purpose of local government, it is to enable democratic local decision making and action by and behalf of communities. Now, there's a comma between the and behalf of. So that sentence is written two ways. In local decision making by the communities is one of the activities, by communities. Now, that means you have to have a significant engagement policy. The decision making process by your community must mean that the community is involved at the decision making point, can't be involved at the end of it. And I think, you know, we've had some recent training and, and the distinction between engagement and consultation has come up. And I think this is a good example of where we've done consultation at a time where we probably could have done some more engagement beforehand. And if we'd done the engagement beforehand, we probably would have come up with a different plan and you would have had much less different blowback. What this resolution really is saying is, can, can, can we go back and do a bit more engagement before we finally settle it in and embed it so hard? There is no, there is no complaint to staff here that your intentions were not good. But, but the effect, that, but the strong response of some members of this community indicates that they feel that they were not engaged. And we have a tendency to say, well, if, you, if we view you as empowered, then your upsetness might be not as important as an unempowered person who is upset at not being listened to by council, but we have to listen to all people at council. And the other point is, what is our role as council laws in this engagement? We have an interface into the community we do things and we talk to groups that are not part of the staff engagement process because of our own lives. I was in South Dunedin and I was told by a Catholic down there that you know there's a mass at the Moran building every Sunday and it's, and it's intended by very old people that are going to have trouble getting to the building if they can't get close to it. You know, I don't know if the Disabled People's Assembly was, was included in this discussion is not as well. We're, we're talking, sometimes we're talking, we're focused on the tour operators but I have a feeling that we could have probably engaged a lot better and a lot deeper going forward. And we didn't even ask the question, if we're trialling and experimenting, should we do our first experiment so long? Because it's quite a long closure period, because we need data. So what do we know about the traffic movements that are going to be occurring when we do this? I am 100% behind data, I'm 100% behind these trials, that's why I endorsed it. I wanted us to go ahead with what we're doing, I don't want us to roll this thing completely backwards. But I do think that we probably need to make sure that the community is really happy with what we do before we just go forward again. So that's why I'll be voting yes for this. Councillor Benson Pope. <clears throat> Strangely, um, for exactly the same reasons as Councillor O'Malley has just articulated, I won't be supporting this because I think the discussions are already happening. Um, and I think the timing, of, I've got no major issue with what the resolution proposes, but I think it's redundant. Um, certainly the, um, the mandate was not entirely in place for what has been suggested, whatever that is and whichever iteration it is. Uh, and clearly there has been an extraordinary amount of inaccurate information or lack of information around some of the people who couldn't get the maps that, you know, of what was going to be where and what exactly was proposed and things have not been ideal. But it would seem to me that since this issue, since the waves first started crashing, um, the amount of discussion and change that has happened is, is shown. 
the ability of staff to be flexible and respond to the issues that have been raised, just as no doubt the issues that have been raised again today will be responded to as this trial or trials evolve. So I don't think the, <clears throat> the notice of motion is necessary because I think the work is already happening. I think we're just wasting our time and indeed potentially uh, putting an extraordinary extra meeting discussion burden onto staff uh, who would be better to get around the, the different factions involved and let's not put too fine a point on that. Uh, because there's always been a lot of view factionalised from different groups around the use of public spaces and come to some solutions that are uh, generally agreed. I want to see successful trials uh, and unsuccessful trials, though I'd prefer more of the former, of all sorts of different things in our public spaces because that will guide us to a better urban, central urban Dunedin. Um, but I don't want to put, send staff on wild goose chases that are not necessary when they're already well and truly engaged on these issues. Thank you. So, uh, thank you. Uh, I can't support this. The, the comment has been made by the mover and others around we need to take more time uh, here in terms of planning this, but the message I got from presenters at the public forum is that the uncertainty of what's going on is one of the things that they are most concerned about. And so uh, exacerbating that level of uncertainty I don't think is helpful. Uh, nobody is sitting in this room arguing that the communication around this project couldn't have been handled better. Um, but we have also heard from Mr Phelan and Mr McGowan both uh, you know, passing on their thanks to staff for the work that our staff have done ongoing to help them mitigate the impacts on the various users uh, of this uh, of this uh, public space. To which um, I, I support the previous speaker, and that I think uh, this is uh, largely unnecessary. And my concern, mainly with it, aside from the, the overall debate about what we should end up doing with the octagon, the thing I'm most concerned about around the notice of motion is B. Uh, uh, discuss the plans thoroughly with all affected parties weekly and my understanding is that list runs into the hundreds. I don't know how big the plaza meeting room Councillor Raddick has been using is, um, but I don't know if they would all um, fit in there. Um, I've received plenty of positive feedback about this. I don't think the opinion of our community is universal um, and so I would hate for that to be, uh, for that to be lost. Um, this is a trial, of course, not just of what we're doing, but of how we are doing it. And it was unlikely that it was ever going to be done perfectly uh, the first time. Uh, and, and, but that isn't uh, an excuse to run for the hills or uh, to not uh, continue. The, the Octagon is our public square, somewhat ironically. And so it is a heavily contested space and balancing the, the needs and wants of the various users of that space is always going to be difficult. This is always going to be fraught. Uh, and I think um, you know, these are the decisions and the discussions uh, around this table that will be difficult and will be messy because there is a great, a great degree of community interest and concern around this uh, space and how it is used uh, and, and some of those voices uh, have a, a greater volume and tenor than others. Uh, the last point I want to make really is around the resolution of council and the spectre that's been raised that it requires, should require a resolution of council for the octagon uh, to be closed uh, to traffic, not to people. Um, but it isn't a decision that we take uh, when we put, set up the midwinter carnival there. It isn't a decision this body makes around New Year's Eve. It isn't a decision we make around Thieves Alley. It isn't a decision we make around the pipe band championships. These are all decisions that staff make to allocate that space to those events for short periods of time. Yes, this is unusual in the duration, uh, but I think we've got to be careful about going down a path where all of those operational decisions, um, the use of the upper octagon, the use of the lower octagon, the use of the space, graduation parades, polytechnic and university down the main street, none of these decisions are made by the governing body of the council, um, but they are decisions delegated to staff uh, for events that add to the vibrancy of our community. So I, I just think I'd like to sound a, a note of caution around just how involved uh, this table wants to be in those kinds of matters, because we haven't been up until now, and I can't see a feasible way 
given the meeting schedule we've just passed off, of being able to do it uh, with any alacrity uh, ongoing, if that was the will of this body. Uh, further speakers? Councillor Houlihan, your right of reply. Thank you, Your Worship. I hear what you're saying about, and the, what several other councillors have said as well, about governance and operations. However, I strongly disagree. This is a governance issue. Um, it was brought to council, and council agreed for partial closure. And I know what you're saying about we haven't gone to, um, the council hasn't decided these in the past. However, you're talking about special events. This trial is completely different, and there are a lot of stakeholder groups that are affected by this. It's completely different to one-off closures of the octagon. And I hear what you're saying, and I respect your opinion. However, um, I also um, strongly um, feel a bit hurt, actually, that people think that I would use this motion to abuse or, or tell off staff. This is not my intention. I made it very clear. I don't know how many more times I needed to say in my opening speech that was not the intention. However, I'm an Institute of Directors member, and I do know the difference between governance and operations. When something like this that has clearly gone wrong, it is tarnishing the council's reputation, that is when, as a governance level, we are, are remiss if we do not do something. And that is why there was no other motion. If there'd been a motion on the, you know, on the council um, agenda, I would have let that go ahead. But there was no other motion, even though we've had letters most days to the editor and sent to our emails. We've had stories regularly in the paper about it, yet there was no mention, apart from the motion that not just myself, but several of us wrote about the octagon. And I just find that, and, you know, I'm sorry, but I didn't think that was suitable. So the reason why um, this motion is here is, yes, you're correct. I think the wording of the second part of it could be changed slightly, but as Councillor O'Malley said, it was written uh, you know, a week or so ago, and things have moved forward. If um, I could, I would amend it, but you said we couldn't. Um, I would have written in to say, you know, look, let's propose we just have the lower part of the octagon closed. That is what people want. And, you know, I would be more than happy with that. My hope is that if we put this, go out with this engagement and after council staff have heard from a governance level what has been discussed, they will, this, this might be the outcome. That is my hope. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. I'll take the vote by division. Your Worship, okay. can we take it in two parts? Or two parts? Uh, you can. This is for Part A. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Gary. No. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lefiso. No. Councillor Lord. No. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. Aye. Can Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. Aye. Councillor Walker. No. Your Worship. No. Carried 8-6. This is for B. Councillor Barker. No. Councillor Benson Pope. No. Councillor Elder. No. Councillor Gary. No. Councillor Hall. Councillor Houlihan. Feel free. <laughs> Feel free. I'm happy for that to change, so I'm probably a no for that one. 
Councillor Lafiso. No. Councillor Lord. No. Councillor O'Malley. No. Councillor Reddick. Yes. <coughs> Councillor Staines. No. Councillor Vandervis. Yes. Councillor Walker. No. Your Worship. No. And that was lost 11 3. Thank you. That brings us to the end of the public part of the agenda. I'll move, uh, as per the order paper, that Council move into confidential for the reasons outlined in said agenda. Seconded, Councillor Staines. Uh, and I'll oh, wait and specify that Keith uh, Cooper be permitted to attend the meeting to speak to item C2 uh, to provide assistance in relation to the matters uh, to be discussed. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Uh, we'll break for five minutes for our cameras to withdraw. Aye. Aye. Ah. Aye. I move that we adjourn five minutes, second of Councillor Staines. Those in favour? Aye. 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 Aye.